this means light bringer presents between two weirwoods live discussion panel this week's topic world building featuring history of westeros joe magician joe magician secrets of the citadel and your host lucifer means light bringer All right. Thank you, Mr. John Walsh, for the good flamenco guitar, as always. And uh, I forewent the, uh, and thank you, Gemma, for reading our lovely introduction, of course. I forewent the actual video intro because I've had a whole bunch of trouble trying to get that to work with Google Hangouts. Uh, so eventually I'll get that happening. I'll talk to somebody smarter than me and figure that out. But we got you a picture and we got you wonderful Gemma. So that's going to, it's going to have to get you in the mood for today. So. With that, let me introduce my guest, starting with Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. Say hello, Gemma. Hi, I'm Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. I'm really excited to be here and to be talking about world building in the Song of Ice and Fire. Thank you for having me on Lucifer Means Lightbringer. Um, let's get some. Yes, this is going to be a good one. This is going to be full, full on nerd apocalypse here but we will not forget <laughs> to uh keep keep in mind the harding conflict of course so aziz from history of westeros is my next guest say hello aziz hello aziz oh yes you didn't mean that yeah no that's that's an old joke it's not really that funny anymore but sometimes it case you by surprise yeah hey everybody i'm aziz from history of westeros and this is a really fun topic that i'm excited to discuss of course um, my show focuses on this kind of topic in a sense quite often. So uh, it's right in my wheelhouse and I've got a lot to say and I'm eager to hear what my co-panelists have to say as well. So let's do it. And finally, the one and the only, the star of his own self-titled YouTube channel, Joe Magician. Hello everybody, it's me, it's Joe Magician. Uh -huh. Uh, you can also yeah. find me on the <laughs> Mr. Monthly oh God, podcast and Watchers on the Wall. I'm going to do the whole thing. I'm going to do all the titles just to make you uncomfortable. I'm just kidding. Titles, uh, titles. No. <laughs> and uh, I just put out a, a video on Brandon Stark with Aziz, who was reading the quotes, which made me giggle endlessly while I was <laughs> editing it. <laughs> really. Made me giggle, too. <laughs> he, I made him read some of the best parts of George's writing, quote unquote. And uh, I'm gonna be having a thing coming out in the next week or so with Amanda from Disputed Lands uh, about Targaryen prophecy. So look forward to that. Uh, Steven Stark hitting us up with the honorary $6.66 super chat. Thank you, Steven, horns high. Uh, <laughs> he says, the dream panel, really looking forward to this one. Is anything missing from the world building? I've noticed very few festivals or holy days. Mm. Uh, we, do, we do have a section set aside for critiquing uh, the world building, but we will be fanboying for a solid hour and a half before we get to that part. So eventually, <laughs> eventually. All a right. good balance. And, and I'd also like to give a nod to Sandrixian, the Hand of the Dragon, also creator of this lovely Sandrixian t-shirt. You can get her gear at sandrixian.com, and I think... Uh, I've yeah, we're all we're all grabbing some. She's got all kinds of cool stuff and more stuff on the way, including uh, Kerberos, uh, the very own uh, Care Bear Cthulhu hybrid uh, creation that was designed right here live on Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel not three weeks ago. So uh, yeah, that's happening. Uh, guys, do take. Let's go back through, and I want you to tell me what it is that you have been working on most recently or what you're going to be working on. Joe, I know you mentioned the one yeah. thing, but uh, Gemma, what are you, 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 you were a good boy and uh, followed the outline, but Gemma, tell me uh, what, you, what are you working on lately? Um, I've been working on my Unraveling the Text series because every time I post a video that is not my Unraveling the Text series, I get a flurry of comments When's the next unraveling the text? When's the next unraveling the text? Why are you wasting our time with theories about Bram Stark and the Night King when we need the next chapter? I'm already four yeah. chapters ahead of you. You know, this is outrageous. I kind of feel like George R. R. Martin, just a tiny, tiny bit. I mean, obviously on a way less huge scale of the Winds of Winter debacle. But so yeah, I've, I've been working on that. I can't 
what people don't seem to understand is I can't just do one chapter in isolation. I will do several chapters in one go because they, they throw back to each other, as you know. So I've got about six now in the pipeline that I'm putting the finishing touches to. So there will be, there you go, Johnny Jedi, when is the next unraveling video? It's coming very soon, I promise. <laughs> yeah, are you are you trying to say that people in this fandom can be slightly impatient? What? Uh, <laughs> that's just no, no, no. beyond the pale. I mean, yeah. Uh, guys, are what do you mean? What happened to to my new HD camera? Are you guys not seeing me in glorious HD? Let me just double check. Uh, no, yeah, you look as beautiful as you normally do. So yeah, maybe you need to bump up your settings or something. I'm I'm here, baby. I'm in I'm in mm -hmm. HD. <laughs> that should be. Anyways, um, all right. So, uh, Aziz, what have you been working on lately? All right. Well, we have been working on the second part of a Blood Raven episode. We are the second episode is going to cover all his time as Hand. There's a lot to deal with there. The reigns of Ares the First and Makar, and there's a lot of this is the time period when. The prophecies that Rhaegar stumbled on later got discovered. Uh, this is Maester Aemon, Blood Raven, Ares the First, and uh, all these other guys who got that stuff started. The stuff that Rhaegar kind of stumbled onto later and started mailing. I almost said emailing, emailing Rhaegar, <laughs> uh, Aemon about on the wall, yep. <laughs> Bas basically. and uh, and going back and forth on. So that's really cool stuff. And there's obviously a lot of Blackfire stuff in that episode. And after that, we're going to be working on Nymeria. Um, Nymeria, not the wolf, but the Roynish uh, person of uh, of great fame from history. There's a lot to say about her, and she goes to so many interesting places. So that it's also, you know, we get to explore Sothorios and and Nath and the, the Basilisk Isles and all this cool stuff. Plus, and, and then just let alone the politics that and adventures that happen once she actually gets to Dorne. So lots of fun stuff there. And before that, we did a Crips of Winterfell episode and um, been releasing a lot of our panels from Con of Thrones like you have. That's been a lot of fun, too. Well, that so about covers that, it. Would that be uh, maester.amen at glasscandle.net? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, maybe, uh, or maybe at nightswatch.org. You know, yeah. I don't know how they, how totally. they do these things. <laughs> Glass Candle's like the server in that, in that instance. But uh, yeah, there will be plenty <laughs> of chat sightings. And you guys, you missed out about 10 minutes before we started. <laughs> Aziz, Aziz had pointed his camera at the floor and was just giving like full full on belly rubs to his like 50 pound cat or whatever. I wasn't a belly rub. <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> <laughs> he like likes to be spanked. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay. So I like to ask all of my guests here on Between Two Weirwoods. Uh, one simple question, which is, what makes George R. R. Martin great? And of course, uh, if you guys have watched the panels that I put out from Con of Thrones, you know that I did a panel called What Makes George R. R. Martin Great with two out of three of today's guests, with Joe and Gemma. And uh, Aziz was actually supposed to be on that panel, but Aziz was a big star and was doing 12 other panels and was conflicted out of that one. So uh, originally the idea was to sort of just take up that topic of what makes George great and do another panel with the same guests and this time invite Aziz uh, because there is so much different things to talk about. But as we uh, chatted this week, we sort of zeroed in on world building as one sort of really cool aspect of George's writing to vamp out on. So that's the, gonna be the topic today is world building. So setting aside world building, uh, why don't each of you give me, starting with Gemma, uh, one other thing that you like about George's writing that makes his writing great that is uh, noteworthy. Wow, yeah, I, I I struggled to think of one thing, and I also struggled to find something that wasn't necessarily related to world building, and I couldn't. This is related somewhat to world building. For me, it's the foreshadowing. It's it's all about foreshadowing, because this world is just full of it. every word, every statement, every bold statement from a character that inadvertently foretells their doom, the, the dreams, the prophecies, the visions. Um, and, and again, this does tie in with world building, but we've got house sigils, we've got fools and jesters, and we've got songs. There's just so many different types of foreshadowing that goes on. Um, one particular example I really enjoy is things like the symbolism that goes on, like the weirwood trees in the respective godswoods 
of all of the noble houses all have a very distinctive and different look about them. The one at Harrenhal just looks utterly terrifying and it's got three huge scratch marks that bleed red. Um, the one at Casterly Rock is struggling to grow. Um, the ones in this three in the reach and they're huge and they're bursting with life. And, and, and that in itself is a, a more subtle version of foreshadowing for these noble houses. But then we've got the real full on foreshadowing, the direwolves, the names of the direwolves, the fates of their direwolves. I have seen people say that the foreshadowing for this world is a bit on the nose sometimes, but I, I don't agree with that. I think in retrospect it is, of course, you know, because we go back and read that and go, oh, of course it was there. Um, these passing comments that slip by you the first read, but then when you go back, it is blatant. It's and to the point where it's almost hilarious. I've got a couple of examples. Um, Theon says that Hodor did not know much, but no one could doubt that he knew his name. Um, <laughs> Catelyn. Catelyn felt her heart had turned to stone. At the time, you just think, oh, that's, you know, she's, she's really feeling it right now. You look back on a reread and go, of course, it's all there. Um, the Hound tells Arya, keep your mouth shut and do as I tell you, and we may even be in time for your uncle's bloody wedding. I, I just love this stuff. I love it because you don't catch it the first time. So that it's not on, it's only on the nose in hindsight. And, and that's kind of the point of foreshadowing. And this comes back to what we were saying, doesn't it, LML, that this is why it takes so long for George R. R. Martin to write this stuff, because he's going to have to go back, isn't he? And slip all of this in once he's got the theme and the, the arc established, then he has to go back and, and slide in all this incidental foreshadowing that you might not spot at, at the time. I've got a couple that haven't come to fruition yet. Um, we might want to discuss where we think that's going in the chat. Um, my favorite is John to Aria, the you'll be sewing all winter quote. I love that one so much. <laughs> um, John thinks he might as well wish for another thousand uh, men and maybe a dragon or three and then there's the dragon sign at the inn that washes away it turns from black to red so there's some examples of foreshadowing that haven't necessarily paid off yet i'm done yeah my, my favorite uh foreshadowing <laughs> my favorite foreshadowing that was like not super obvious at first but now is really obvious is when it says uh one day the other moon will kiss the sun too and crack and the dragons will return i mean the first time you read that, you didn't understand that that was actually a prophecy of a future moon disaster to cause the long night. But at this point, you know, we can all see that that's obviously coming in the next book. So good points, Gemma. Uh, so uh, that, was, uh, that was me being as straight as I could there. Um, but no, to, to what you're I mean, it touches. So your point that you were, first of all, OK, so I think you just named a topic for a future between two weirwoods because yeah. we could do a great panel on foreshadowing. Uh, I think sure. as you as you were talking, it, it just rang out in my mind. I was like, whoa, this is a two hour topic for sure. We could talk about foreshadowings that have come to pass, like you just mentioned. We can talk about uh, future you know, foreshadowings potentially and get into predicting some of the winds of winter. I was thinking about doing a predicting winds of winter panel, uh, but a foreshadowing panel might actually make more sense and would let us give some predictions. So uh, I will definitely have you on that panel. Uh, oh, count we, me in. Yeah, definitely. That's, 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 we got to do that. Uh, in fact, maybe we'll just get this whole group together. And after I've uh, cycled through some other people that I need to get on the show, like uh, my friend Robert from Indeed Geek and, uh, you know, some other folks. So, but yeah, that was great. And uh, the, what you said, the idea that he, he, the foreshadowing is obvious in retrospect, but when you first read it, it's not as obvious. This is something that we're going to uh, touch on with world building because he uses that same principle where, the world building is totally fantastical and amazing, but somehow slips by unnoticed the first time you read it because there's this really intense emotional drama happening at the same time. And he's sort of distracting you or even there might be like five things going on at one time. If you're talking about like the house of the undying vision or something like that. So yeah, that's a, that's a really important technique is Martin sort of holds your attention over here. And then over here, he's like doing something different. Uh, and, you know, sneaking the guys uh, through the back door or whatever. So 
Yeah, it's uh, that's uh, great stuff, and it does overlap with world building a little bit, but it's definitely its own topic. So, uh, Joe Magician, what makes George great besides uh, world building and <sighs> besides world building? Um, I I'm not sure what the right word for this, but I guess it would, it would describe it as the depth of of the books, and it's I don't just mean um, the complexity of the plot itself. I just mean that how much you can you can get out of these books if you really want to. And it keeps giving back. It keeps paying off the effort you put in. I mean, looking at the people on our panel, we have somebody obsessed with symbolism, somebody that loves history, me that loves uh, tinfoil theories, and Gemma who sort does sort kind of all three of them. And we all have our passion and we keep finding things to find in the story. I mean, there are people that only focus on things like the gender roles within it or focusing on like even just like small houses and making entire um, series out of it. it. It's unusual that the more you give to trying to understand and analyze these books and the and the world building, honestly, and even the, like the short stories in his world book, it keeps giving back. It keeps making it worth it. I I don't think I've ever read a series where that's true. <laughs> this is maybe the first one where that's happened. Inevitably, the author falls down or they lose interest in certain parts of the story. Or they really just want they really just want to tell one part of it, but George has made almost a complete world much, and <laughs> there's and there's it's all useful too. It's not like pipe weed like we see from Lord of the Rings, or <sighs> from other authors. Just these these topics that kind of go nowhere. He's he's sharing with us, and it's all productive, and it all helps you understand the story if you want to. I'm going to ignore that slight on pipe weed. Uh, <laughs> obviously that was the worst rude. entrance to a story I have ever seen. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Joe, how, Joe how, let me just ask you, Joe, how much weed do you smoke? Uh, not that much anymore. Last okay. time I did, I got lost in the woods and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I was at a bachelor party and I hadn't Ooh. smoked in like a year or something like that. And we all got, we all stood in a circle in the middle of the woods while it was raining, got Whip. got wicked baked and decided to go find a totem pole, which is actually about 30 feet away, but it was dark, so we couldn't see it. So we were walking around for a half hour in the dark and I was just freaking out. I'm like, screw you guys, I'm going home. <laughs> oh Did you see any really small houses when you were wandering around? <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, the, the grass was pretty tall. Maybe there was a hobbit nearby. <laughs> so that, Joe, is where, I think, that is where I was going. Yes, <laughs> I think I can explain to you as a as a cannabis medical cannabis expert uh, who lives in California. I can tell you that what probably happened is that you had a strain called Wolf Howl, mm -hmm. and Wolf Howl. Uh, it says right here that somewhere in the great stone maze of Winterfell, a wolf howled. The sound hung over the castle like a flag of mourning. Tyrion Lannister looked up from his books and shivered. Through the uh, though the library was snug and warm, something about the howling of a wolf took a man right out of his here and now and let hi left him in a dark forest of the mind, running naked before the pack. So I was not naked. I mean, you were kind of out of your you're kind of out of your head there. How do you know you weren't naked? You know? well, maybe um, maybe you know something happened yeah. while you were. Tracing through the woods, you know. I feel but, like you're writing slash fiction right now. Is this is like what you want to have happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, yeah, true. He's just making the point that stoned Joe Magician might not be the best witness as to what actually happened. <laughs> no, the, the main problem was the guy who was leading us had, had seen the map of the property earlier and knew where it was and was just messing with us. Like we were walking <laughs> around the thing, but none of us knew where we were. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> what, what sorry, I just told that whole story. <laughs> no, that was actually a joke. To be serious, that was a really good. Uh, that was a really good answer. The that's the whole point. I always compare um, George Martin to like prog rock or classical music, where like you don't get it the first time you hear it. You maybe enjoy it, but it's really not until that fifth listen that like you really start to get it. And the twentieth listen might be more sweet. Um, you know, so that's. Everything that makes George great lends itself to this dynamic where you can go back and find more and more stuff. And Aziz actually made a point similar to that about world building that we'll get into uh, in a minute. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that you can sort of, you know, read the books one time and enjoy it. But, uh, it, you know, you go back five times, there's more stuff to find every time. So, Aziz, what makes George great, my friend? 
All right. Um, well, I just want to also add on to something Gemma said, and I appreciate that she said it's really hard to find something that doesn't relate to world building. Because to me, when she started talking about foreshadowing, that's uh, she's right, uh, very right. To me, also though, George uses history as foreshadowing quite a lot, and to me, that's part of the world building. So I, I'm not saying she's wrong. Obviously, I just wanted to show just how much world building bleeds into everything. Like I totally get where you're coming from. It's like it's really hard to pick something that doesn't involve the world building. Um, for me, uh, something I think that makes George R. R. Martin great is just the way he approached the 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 world. And I know that sounds like world building, but I mean the reader's experience in the world. I don't mean the world itself, which is that. Unlike most fantasy stories, we don't ever have a narrator. We never have a narrator who knows everything. Like in Lord of the Rings and all these other things that you get the top-down view from someone who knows everything. Um, but George tries to, even with the world book, even with the world of ice and fire, that's a maester who wrote that. That's not, you know, a narrator who knows everything. So I think the that he's the consistency of the setting, the way he approaches the material in terms of how the reader interacts with it, I think is really neat. Um, he tries to, I think that's part of what makes it a little more immersive. It gives it that extra notch above maybe other styles. It isn't necessarily better, but I think it does get you, for some of us, it gets you deeper involved and you can kind of maybe, it's a little easier to imagine yourself there or to put yourself in the middle of it all. Um, to get immersed. So I think that's a, a really good, a really good thing. And it's not, George isn't the first one to do it by any means, but it's, it wor he does it really well and, and makes great use of that, of that technique. Yeah. The, <clears throat> that was one of the topics that uh, I tried to touch on in like the last five minutes of our con panel on the way out the door. I was like, Oh yeah, by the way, he does a, a, a reliable narrator limited third person. And it's really cool. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. what you did. <laughs> <laughs> that is basically what happened, but it's true. I, I I was disappointed that we ran out of time so quickly because to me that's like just so crucial to what George does. And when I read other books and they have that little did he know it was the last time he would ever see his sister. Like those things just completely ruin it for me and make it super heavy handed and kind of goes with George's whole thing. You know, he's he really believes in the show don't tell and he just takes it to the ninth degree giving you these unreliable narrators and giving you their own inner monologue as the narrator, which may be completely wrong. I mean, the best, if you don't get it by the time you read the Victorian chapter, uh, then I don't know what to say. I mean, it was obvious when you read Theon 1 to me, like when you read Theon 1, that's when you come face to face with the unreliable narrator and you're like, oh, okay, I see what he's doing here. So, Or when answer. everyone looks at the comet, right? Everyone looks yeah. at the comments. <laughs> something different right they all right. like oh that's my comment and they're like oh no that comment is the color of the lannister no that comment's the color of blood everyone had it it's so cool because it's what it's like the only thing in the series that everyone got to have an opinion on because they all saw it at the same moment which is without the internet you can't really have things like that <laughs> that everyone can look at at the same time no matter where they are Westeros you know? <laughs> Twitter would be wild what'd you say? yeah what'd you say joe Westeros Twitter would be wild. Oh. <laughs> Hashtag red comet. <laughs> Hashtag red <laughs> Are you guys seeing this thing? Look outside right now. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, so uh, San Rixian, I uh, hit us with a little super chat. Say great job so far. Go get him. Thanks, Sanry. And uh, Painkiller Jane, you. a frequent uh, contributor to Mythical Astronomy, uh, pipes in with her answer about what makes George great. And I wanted to read it. She said, critiquing the modern world is her absolute favorite. And that also strikes me as an interesting topic for a panel discussion, all the ways that George is critiquing the modern world. So nice answer there. What do you guys think about that? Oh, I did a whole video on climate change and I got absolutely slaughtered in my comments section for that one. But I stand by <laughs> it. I absolutely stand by it 100 percent. This is analogous. Wow. I Amongst feel bad. I feel bad for anybody who doesn't get that. I mean, that's like really basic yeah, that's obvious yeah, I know, right? <laughs> endless winter i mean nobody's ever heard of nuclear winter it's it's even without climate change it's it's a topic <laughs> it's an easy yeah. one yep. I thought it was and, he, and i like how things. he's this is this is something i talked about with poor quentin on twitter the other day how it's not necessarily how it's definitely part of the story the, the, the climate change uh analogy but it's not necessarily part of the story in terms of the others aren't necessarily motivated by, oh, we're getting back at mankind for destroying nature. I don't think it's that. I think that's what we 
consensus on the surface, but ultimately I don't think it's going to be that simple or even necessarily that at all. But it's there, whether but that you can't not see that angle, even if it doesn't turn out to be like part of their motivation. Since we're not going to learn their motivation, it's going to be for, you know, if we ever do, it won't be for another book or so. So that'll have been more than 20 years of us, you know, with this climate change analogy kind of hanging out there. So we're not going to just forget about that if it turns out that they just it was more about, well, this was survival, because I, I, to me, it's more about survival, like the children were dying out and the, the or, or not survival, but rather religion. You know, they were the first men were cutting down the trees, which is like those were literally their gods. You're killing their gods. I think that's, you know, that's not nature, so to speak. It is. But it's more about the fact that those are former green seers and you're killing them and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm really going on a tangent here, but you see what I mean. It's not uh, George contain does this multiple meaning thing he allows us to think about climate change because he wants us to but he doesn't even have to explicitly make it part of anyone's motivations inside the story although yeah. that door is certainly open if he wants and to. i did i did make this incredibly clear in the video that this is just one element this is just one aspect that can be taken from this it, it's not necessarily part of the story as a whole and there are so many other layers to this but this is one of the layers Let's have a look at it. But yeah, it wasn't hugely well received by some people that told me climate change was fake news, which I didn't really feel was the point of the video. Yeah. But it's just me. <laughs> yeah, well, anytime you touch on any topic that's quasi political, then you'll get the mm -hmm. the the loud minority to, you know, speak up on on either side or whatever. But nevertheless, uh, that's not going to stop us content creators because <laughs> we're going to say what we think and that's how it is. So good job. And uh, yeah, so nice, nice one, Painkiller Jane. And of course, yeah, he criticizes the modern world, and all kinds of things. And there's a lot of human sins that transcend time as well. Uh, and George loves uh, talking about power. And power is one of those things that translates into any time. Like, for example, uh, the way that mankind uses technology. You could look at technology as the fire of the gods, you know, or just even just chemistry, like the ability to mess with genetics and create nuclear bombs and stuff. This is something that we just stumbled upon ra fairly rapidly in terms of human existence. And now there's this question of what will we do with it? Will we blow ourselves up or will we heal ourselves or a little bit of both? And how's that work? And it's up to us to handle, quote unquote, the fire of the gods in a responsible way. Uh, and so that metaphor works, you know, it works on a lot of levels. And of course, power and abuse of power is one of George's main topics. So, yeah. Anyway, it's explicit with Valeria and um, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're talking their yeah. flesh pits where they would create new animals for funsies mm -hmm. and how they used the amazing power of the dragons and whatever they did to the 14 flames and to basically enslave most of Essos, probably a bad example of how to use uh, nature. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll go for uh, world's most controversial live stream ever sometime, and we'll do Critique <laughs> of the Modern World. That'd be fun. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so that with, uh, with those uh, formalities and introductions uh, taken care of, we will now plunge into the main topic. Um, somebody actually had a good suggestion uh, to go ahead and start with the definition of world building. Uh, so Gemma, you want to take a stab at that? Oh, how, I can't yeah. really put that in a single, so it's a huge concept, isn't it? I mean, we could talk geographically, you know, like the maps and we, we have entire books of maps, but it's, it's, it's far more than just the geography, the actual world. It's, it's what goes into the world, what makes the world, what makes the people, their cultures, um, their lifestyles, their day-to-day, -day, everyday business, the way they look at the world, the way they view each other and themselves, and, and all of the small nuances that have contributed to that. Um, and, and I mean, I don't, I'm not going to launch into examples yet because I know we have so many from the Song of Ice and Fire, but yeah, it, it's basically... It's, it's everything that contributes to that realism. This is a fantasy, but and we keep calling it real fantasy, realistic fantasy, don't we? And, and that in itself is a complete oxymoron. How can we say that something with dragons and demon vagina babies is realistic? But yes, <laughs> somehow, somehow it is. 
Um, and it's the world building that does that. It's the world building. It's it's everything, absolutely everything, from the huge um, micro macrocosm to to the mini, small, minute details. It's yeah, basically, it's everything. the environment. If you've got yeah. the characters as the players, the world building is the stage. It's everything about the stage. It's how is this world going to be different from Earth? Like that's usually how people start off with the assumption that it's an Earth-like place, except for we have ice demons and magic comets and magic volcanoes and what have you, what have you. George's fantasy is frequently called low fantasy versus high fantasy, with high fantasy right. being wizards yeah. flying around and throwing fireballs and uh, you know more developed magical powers, low magic being sort of like as if the real world is just turning a little strange, uh, I guess is the way I, I describe George Martin. So the world building is the environment and it is a huge topic like Gemma was saying, because it is, it's everything. It's the land, it's the places, it's the culture, it's the swear words and the idioms they use. It's the way that magic works and all that. So that's why this is such a huge topic and is worthy of a whole panel. Uh, and so world building, um, here's how I'd like to start approach this is with two different George Martin quotes. All right. And the first one is the very famous quote from William Faulkner, famous author. And it says, the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. And George bangs on about this all the friggin' time. He talks about it constantly. Whenever it's uh, a matter of giving advice to authors and stuff, he's always about Hard in conflict, hard in conflict. And what he means is like, it's all about the characters. If you want to engage your readers, you've got to figure out what makes the characters tick, what makes them motivated or conflicted or torn up or make what makes them love or hate. And that's where the story is. Uh, but then on the other hand, we have this idea of world building, which is kind of the opposite, or at least it's it's the other part of the book. And so here's what George Martin says about world building and fantasy in general as a genre. He says, the best fantasy is written in the language of dreams. It is alive as dreams are alive, more real than real, for a moment at least, that long magic moment before we wake. Fantasy is silver and scarlet, indigo and azure, obsidian veined with gold and lapis lazuli. Reality is plywood and plastic done up in mud brown and olive drab. Fantasy tastes of habaneros and honey cinnamon and cloves, rare red meat and wines as sweet as summer. Reality is beans and tofu and the a and ashes at the end. Reality is the strip malls of Burbank, the smokestacks of Cleveland, a parking garage in Newark. Fantasy is the towers of Minas Tirith, the ancient stones of Gormenghast, the halls of Camelot. Fantasy flies on the wings of Icarus, reality on Southwest Airlines. Why do our dreams become so much smaller when they finally come true? We read fantasy to find the colors again, I think, to, to taste strong spices and hear the songs uh, the sirens sang. There is something old and true in fantasy that speaks to something deep within us, to the child who dreamt that one day he would hunt the forests of the night and feast beneath the hollow hills and find a love to last forever somewhere south of Oz and north of Shangri-La. They can keep their heaven. <clears throat> when I die, I'd sooner go to Middle Earth. So there's this romance of um, fantasy as a genre and all the things that make fantasy fantasy, which he's describing as, you know, glittering castles in the sky. I mean, um, but we at the same time, we can see that both of these things are important because uh, he's always talking about the heart in conflict. He's saying it's the only thing worth writing about. So is it is it the only thing worth writing about or is it the dream visions of eating honeyed habaneros with scarlet sirens in Minas Tirith? And can sirens even go to Minas Tirith? Because they kind of need to stay near water. And anyway, so what we're here to talk about today is essentially the synthesis of the heart in conflict and all that fantasy stuff. Uh, Martin excels at working both angles at the same time and using them to complement one another. And there's actually a lot to learn by having a look at how he does this. George has basically tricked, if you, if you guys have noticed, I mean, he's a lot of your friends are into Game of Thrones that probably don't read fantasy. This is a real coup for George because the fantasy audience is only so big, but he has tricked all these people that aren't into fantasy into liking the Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, and so if you want to write fantasy, you, and I'm speaking to you as the would-be writers in the audience, which is probably at least half of us, if you want to write fantasy or sci-fi or techno, steampunk, goth, horror, holographic anime, 
and draw an audience uh, outside of the established niche audience for that genre, then you're going to need to heed Martin's advice and keep the heart in conflict at the forefront, even while you build those crystal castles in the sky. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this is the biggest secret to Martin's world building. So uh, comments on what I just said, folks. The part about um, your friends that aren't into fantasy that are into it now because of Song of Ice and Fire, I think there's no bigger example than our friend Jeff or Brendan Beefish, who does not like fantasy. It's not his thing. He likes military history. He likes things like Accursed Kings. He likes stories that really tone down the magic in it. And now he's at one of the most popular people in the fandom of a series that if you told him at the start of it, that was actually about frozen ice elves and dragons and some kind of weirdness with like incesty stuff, I think he would probably say no. <laughs> but obviously he fell in love with the early parts of the books and then of course Stannis. Fell in love hard with Stannis, but <laughs> it's the I think he's the perfect example of what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, got, and uh, go ahead. I think that's a good. That, I think that's a uh, very true for a lot of us. We probably all have friends that that weren't really into fantasy that got into uh, this this series because of that. Personally, I was I, I was into fantasy as a kid and had fallen out of it, and was more my jam around the time I discovered A Song of Ice and Fire was other than uh, a little bit of being into, say. Uh, <clears throat> Um, Wheel of Time, which my friend had got me to start reading before I had quit fantasy, but it was still going, so I'd pick up that every once in a while. I was really into historical fiction. That was my real jam. I, that was my favorite kind of find an author who actually cares about being historically accurate and then writing stories. That way you're still learning some history while getting entertainment. Uh, but then I discovered this, and so many people I've shared it with have had a similar reaction, whether or not they were into historical fiction. Most of them weren't. It's just they, it, it, it's because most fantasy puts the world building, uh, they almost put it first, but don't put as yeah. much care into it. You know what I mean? It's like the world, the fantasy elements are what drive the story. But in A Song of Ice and Fire, the characters drive the story and they have to, they have to interact with the fantasy elements. So we, what we get is their, human heart in conflict with itself over dragons existing and over white walkers existing rather than you know oh white walkers are a thing and we just walk around and deal with that no this is, this you is can a ignore huge them. Thing. yeah <laughs> you can totally ignore them until basically the winds of winter i mean yeah. or a dance of dragons yeah so, uh, uh, so i think that's awesome yeah a lot of people in the chat are agreeing or saying you know what they're you know that Fantasy is not their favorite genre, and they came from X or Y genre. So, yeah, this is definitely a trick that Martin's done. And throughout this conversation, you know, this is a, between two weirwoods is a very meta show. It's it's basically almost a writer's workshop kind of frame on all of the discussion here because I, I really just find it fascinating, and I think that most of us are either writers or we're big readers, and we find the whole writing process thing interesting. And uh, so this whole thing of like tricking people that don't follow your genre into reading your stuff is is really cool and i think that we should assume that when george is writing he's writing for people outside of his genre like he's thinking about it that way uh because he's very disciplined like anytime he does any fantasy stuff like world building he follows these really strict rules so as to not let it take over the story and i think that's why mm -hmm. He beats it into everyone's brains about the heart in conflict because it's like the number one golden rule to all of his world building or foreshadowing or whatever else is like you just keep the characters always at the focus and in the center. Uh, so you like music. I think it's like music, like how there's a lot of people out right. there that will be like, I don't like country music, but I like Johnny Cash. You know, some like how many times have yeah. you heard someone say something like that? Or I don't like rap, but I like. I don't know. Eminem. Or something. Eminem is common. Yeah, like, yeah. People do say that one a lot, yeah. Uh, or I don't like heavy metal, but I like, I don't know, metallic. I don't know, whatever. People say that kind of thing all the time. And that's, I think George is like, I don't like fantasy, except as long as I'm I think he's that kind of outstanding. It's, it, it transcends the genre. The quality transcends the genre. It's really good. It doesn't matter what genre it is. It's just such, such, such high quality. I think yeah. you're so right. I think that, that heart in conflict, 
it is the golden rule for him and he knows that that's his golden rule but it has to be that that's ultimately what people care about people care about people and, and what's going on in their lives but that second quote that you read to us just then lml that was a gushing love letter to the genre of fantasy i'm on board with that fantasy is my thing fantasy i love fantasy from the day i picked up a book i i, I don't want my stories to be real and mundane. I've got that in everyday life. I want to go hard. I want big. I want flashy. I want huge. I want the imagination to run wild. But I do have another William Faulkner quote that I'd like to read to you. Yeah, go for and it. And it goes like this. Read, read, read. Read everything. Trash, classics, good and bad, and see how they do it. Just like a carpenter who works as an apprentice and studies the master. Read. You'll absorb it, then write. If it's good, you'll find out. If not, throw it out the window. And George R. R. Martin clearly took this advice, and this is what he has done, and this is what we touched upon um, during our panel, wasn't it? This intricate patchwork quilt that he's created. Um, he builds worlds, but he knows what his golden rule is. He never forgets that, and he builds this world, but he takes it from myth and legend and pop culture and other authors, real world history, like Aziz was saying, heavy metal, Marvel, and the list goes <laughs> on, you know, it's, and this is, this is what's so awesome. Just one of the many things that's just so beautiful about this world building is there's, there's a reference everywhere. You can, if you know it, you can see it, you can find it. That's so uh, real quick, uh, uh, Blue Tiger pipes in to tell me that in older versions of Tolkien's Legendarium, there are mermaids, but they are actually incarnate Maiar, uh, so they could actually go to Minas Tirith. So thank you, Blue Tiger. <laughs> Thanks, Blue Tiger. <laughs> Coming in with the knowledge. I just wanted to... That's what we call on brand. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to chime in real quick with another series that uh, that reminds me so heavily of the way George writes. It's the uh, Redwall series by Brian Jock. I think that's how you pronounce his name. It's essentially. It's fantasy, but in a very different way. It's about like little forest critters acting out a medieval like battle world. There's like mice in an abbey, and there's badgers that have like prophecy, and they live in a volcano guarded by rabbits. And it's also the food porn that George loves is also there. But it's the same side kind of thing where there's a uh, there's a there's a POV structure, and also it really doesn't matter that the characters are like little forest animals in the same way that in a song of ice and fire the world building and the magic stuff is all there but you read for the characters and it's it's an exact same kind of thing and it's it's more geared towards teens than adults but it's it's a very similar and good series that i think kind of prime me for a song of ice and fire so so matt you're i noticed that you've got sort of an in the woods theme going on here today um like very animal stoned mm -hmm. running through yeah. the woods in your mm -hmm. mind or something <laughs> just, this is why when i wish we had san rickstein uh the hand of the dragon around to uh draw some cartoons but hey um hey Gemma, i think you've got some sort of horrible fan noise happening in your house there oh uh, let me just uh toggle this ah yep thank you that did it mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it's funny how the microphones find that that frequency. Just finally. Just, this is the most important frequency to magnify. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, um, so uh, we've already touched on some of these, but real quick, I'm just going to read. I made a list of sort of some of the various techniques uh, that Martin uses to world build, and then uh, we sort of added to it and... In any case, I'm gonna read the first six of these, which you've already touched on, that are sort of the basics of the world building rules. And then we'll talk about them a little bit. So number one, keep it short. As we said, don't go on and on and kill the narrative flow. Don't bore the reader. So the world building needs to be limited. Um, and you never wanna just world build. Martin never does this. Um, he always juxtabuilds, uh, ju juxtabuilds. That's awesome. That's, That's great. Good... I love that. That actually is. That works. <laughs> he always juxtaposes his world building with some sort of narrative tension. And this disguises the nerdy world building uh, so that the reader doesn't get uh, feel like they're being indulged with info dumpy world building stuff. There's a narrative tension on which hopefully has the reader's main attention. And then, like I said, the world building is sort of slipping by in the background. Um, and ideally, the world building will complement the narrative in creative ways. 
And more specifically, we want the world building to fit the POV of the character whose chapter we're reading. Um, we talked about this on the Nauticast, the two Nauticast episodes that I've done recently. Uh, one was about Bran's coma dreams, and the other one was about Danny's chapter where she gets the prophecy of the moon's cracking and, uh, you know, the dragon's eggs appear to be giving off thousand lights and all this stuff. And both of those were an example of where the, the dream visions worked with the themes of the chapter, like Bran's coma visions very much are about his personal fears. He's falling and can't wake up. You know, it was a personal terror going on for Bran at that moment. Uh, and so the dream visions sort of only complement and enhance that meaning. The same thing for Danny. All her dreams about the dragons uh, have to do with her sort of becoming the dragon and overcoming her pain, becoming stronger and becoming the mother of dragons and taking on this new identity. So it's not just dreams about dragons and stories about dragons, but they're things that tie into Danny personally. So the world building has got to fit the POV. And then moving on beyond POV characters, we've also got all the minor characters. And George is very fond of talking about how every minor character of his is the hero of their own story. And so every little character like Sir Shadrick the Mad Mouse that we were talking about on Twitter today, for example, he's got his little backstory. And George takes a minute to think about the backstory of every character and their their that backstory is basically their heart in conflict it's whatever their conflict is if it's a hedge knight that's down on his luck his backstory is about how he got down on his luck and what's motivating him and making him tick in the world and uh, i was just reading the sansa chapters with little finger in the veil the other day and little finger is addressing this actually like head on in a meta way he's like once you know what motivates somebody you can move them as a piece on a chessboard. And that's basically Martin telling you about the heart and conflict. It's like, it's all about what motivates the characters. So um, I'll go ahead and stop there and turn it back over to the panel for comments. Build upon these points. Gemma, you told me that I had to uh, specifically give you license to talk or you would be quiet. So go ahead and pipe up Gemma. On, <laughs> uh, on first any of those. One, yeah, no, I, I, I'm aware that being in the UK, sometimes there's a slight delay. So if I jump in there, I, I, chances are I'm speaking over somebody and I don't want to do that. Your first point, keep it short, right? Keep it short. I'm not 100% sure he does that, to be fair. <laughs> Look, some of his descriptions of food are pretty intense, right? Oh, well, not looking okay, no, Keep food it is, short, food yeah. Is, like this. Food is, is short, an entire right? book. <laughs> and I literally cannot read a Tyrion or a Cersei chapter without reaching for a glass of red wine. You know, it's... <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah, but, let me, let me actually, no, I mean... I, 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 can, I, I, I know what you've gone. I just want to clarify what I mean by that. Like, for example, the uh, the entire story about the second moon wandering too close to the sun is two paragraphs. And it comes in the middle of a chapter where they're talking about Danny and uh, sort of enduring Drogo's lovemaking slash rape and Danny riding on her horse and all her pains and travails. And right in the middle of that, two paragraphs only, we get the moon dragon myth. And then like the Azor High story is three paragraphs that, Salador San tells to Davos. So that's what I mean by like the actual pure info dumpy parts are actually very short. Uh, yeah, except the world of ice and fire, but go on. You've literally taken the words out of my mouth. This is an issue oh. of flow, isn't it? This is the way that he jumps around inside the character's minds. Um, so for example, in the course of a chapter, you could be say following Tyrion on horseback. He's riding back to the Red Keep through the streets of Landing, uh, the streets of King's Landing. And that's that's where he's physically at during that chapter. But throughout the course of the chapter, we're in his mind. He'll be thinking about what's happening in that moment. Then he'll reflect on what happened earlier that day, then that week, then that month, then what he plans to do in the future. And then childhood memories might pop up. And then something he read in a book about an ancient Targaryen king from 200 years ago might remind him of something that his father once told him. And, and we're just jumping around and the minds of these characters, they just flip flop. And this is how realistic internal flow works. Now, if we wanted a full picture of Tyrion's childhood, we're not going to get that in one go, are we? We're not gonna get this big splurge of exposition telling us this is Tyrion and when he was born and blah, blah, blah. We're gonna to have to get these snippets across multiple chapters, multiple books, not even necessarily from his own point of view, but we're gonna, 
piece all that together. But yeah, essentially that's, I'm, I'm on exactly the same page with you. It's flow, it's about those small moments that jump around and just, just a sentence here, a, a paragraph there, and then we start piecing it all together. It's a jigsaw for us, isn't it? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> and even when uh, he does go into a longer, let's say a story about an ancient legend or something, there's always some character at the middle of it and immediately we're given some sort of drama. Like, let's look at the Azor Ahai myth. We're told that Azor Ahai was, he was very sorrowful. Heavy was his heart and great was his sorrow for he knew what he must do. And then he stabs his wife. So there's a lot of emotional tension going on there uh, and ostensibly a, a, some sort of heart in conflict. Uh, and so a lot of the legends, again, they focus on a character and that allows him to then go into more depth with the legend. But yeah, so the, the point is, it's 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 kept tightly in rain. It's not just like, like I said, an info dump kind of a thing. Um, uh, unless he talks about squishers. When he starts dick crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but, uh, well, it, it's funny because when he has ex when he has exposition, which is rare, it stands out because it's rare. One of the more controversial scenes in all the books is the final scene we have, not counting T-Wow chapters, which is Varus explaining to Kevin, who's dying, people are like, why would Kevin tell a dying man anything? Tell him the, a lie to him. I'm like, why would he tell him anything? People use the, you know, in other words, people say, people sometimes say that Kevin is, or Varus is telling the truth to Kevin, because why would you lie to a dying man? But my question is, why would you tell a dying man anything? The truth or a lie? It's all just kind of, a little odd um so it really does stand out when he does that and that makes that that passage get discussed well also it's just a really big important moment and it's the last thing in the last book but it, it's a it, it's the same kind of thing with uh the way you create tension by setting patterns um, this isn't really a world building thing it's a writing thing for example in the series uh, stormlight archive which i won't give any spoilers for uh, but compared to A Song of Ice and Fire, there's, there's two things that they have very distinctly opposite, and neither necessarily is bad. I prefer the Song of Ice and Fire version of this, although I really like Stormlight Archive. Okay, so this is what he does. George, early in the story, kills Ned Star, kills other characters off. That gives you a sense of, oh, wow, any moment, any character can die. It gives you that tension. You have to be... Uh, you don't need to be convinced that the character is in danger. You kind of just know it because of what's happened. Whereas in a Stormlight Archive, he kind of does the opposite. He has several yeah. characters die and then come back. A lot of characters die and come back. So what, what ends up happening is you go, now you have to convince me this character isn't coming back. <laughs> it's not that they, like, they're dead, but you're still not convinced. They're like, because the rules of his setting are that dead is death isn't permanent. Right? So, you know, like, okay, to be fair, in Martin's world, death isn't permanent, but people who die and come back, they have consequences. They, their memories are messed up. Their bodies are unhealed. Their blood doesn't work properly. Their bodily functions don't work properly. So, it's not like the TV show where John just comes back and is like, yeah, I was dead. It sucked. But, hey, now I'm fine. You know? Uh, so <laughs> Also got a cool haircut. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, thanks. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> he just lost some. He didn't lose any blood or anything. He just lost some curls. That's really all. <laughs> beautiful. Lost, lost a few, beautiful, lost a few inches. Curls. So, in de in defense of Sanderson, <laughs> only because um, I I uh, I do. He's got a, a podcast called Writing Excuses, which is a writing podcast that I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of. Um, even though I don't love Sanderson's writing, uh, there's certain things, choices that he makes that uh, aren't. I'm not as much into or whatever, but I do read his books. I do like them. And um, I think I almost like his writing podcast more. But what I was going to say is huh. when you when you break a rule. So Aziz, you made a good point. So as he's done so many death fake outs that death isn't believable or whatever. But it could be that when you choose to break a rule like that, that he's actually going to play on that so that when somebody is finally dead, you expect them to come back and then they don't. And then that's a shock. And he's a very yeah, yeah. next level kind of writer. So it's possible that he's planning on doing something like that because when you break a rule uh, like that, sometimes it's a conscious choice because you're you're then going to set a new expectation and then defy that sort of. So 
Yeah, I, I think know. that's very fair. Yeah, yeah, that is very fair. And to be fair, a little bit off of killing of main characters, he's mostly done it to second and third level characters. But I think that's going to change in TWOW. I think the way he's described how brutal it's going to be, that's uh, you know he's going to show us what's up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I'm excited about that. It's going to be grim. Um, so. Uh, there's two other points that sort of relate to the ones I just made, which is, um, so if we're keeping the world building limited and we're always distracting you while we're doing the world building, when you actually do do world building, you want to make it count. Uh, and you want to essentially spend your dragons wisely. You want to be like Jon Snow. And this is Stannis speaking. He said, you spend your words as if everyone were a golden dragon. I wonder how much gold do you have laid by? So essentially, this is a little bit of a meta wink by George, I think. So use your words wisely. When you go ahead and do the world building, use keywords and phrases that explode in people's minds, get their imagination starting, and then sort of quickly move on without belaboring the description so that it leaves you wanting more. Like, for example, um, we were talking earlier about how George is tricking people who aren't fantasy readers into reading fantasy. Well, a lot of us are fantasy readers. OK, like Gemma was saying, like me and Gemma are in the same boat there. We love fantasy. And what George is doing by keeping the fantasy limited, by only letting you catch these little glimpses of somebody from like around the corner as they disappear, is it leaves you wanting more. You're like, wait, wait, squishers. What? What? Tell me about the squishers. You know, tell me about the, For real? What, the doom. <laughs> all the volcanoes exploded at once. Well, why? How? And then but he moves on. And so it forces you to keep reading and wondering and. As soon as you reveal all the mystery, like the kind of the fun is gone and George knows that. And that's why he chose not to go to a shy, for example, probably. He realized a shy is more effective if we only see it in visions and flashbacks that don't really reveal the full uh, deal. And then uh, this is actually Joe Magician's point. He talked about the slow burn. Uh, so Joe, go ahead and make that point if you would. This has to do a lot with how he's tricked people into basically liking fantasy that normally don't. Um, the actual mechanics of his world and all the things that line up behind it, like you were talking about with like the squishers or like how the 14 flames exploded. Um, if you start off with that, if you, if you put that right in the forefront, Sanderson is uh, famous for this, that his, um, his world building is explicit and in your face all the time. So if you really don't like that stuff, you're probably not going to give the series a chance. It'll, it'll turn you off. You're like, well, I don't really care about the fact that there are like mist swords coming out of the air or this guy that is like jumping around this room in a bizarre way. But if you only have like one chapter, like we talked about with our live stream on the, um, on the prologue, and you show, you show the others once, and then they just disappear entirely, it allows the reader, like you guys were, like you were saying, being like, hey, what? What happened with that ice elf guy thing? What, what's going on there? And it's like goes right into basically like almost like a curse of kings for the next like two books. And that's what I mean by by slow burn. And it's also giving us as uh, as fans more to talk about as it goes along because you can you can pick up these little clues and hints he's leaving behind him, and it inc it increases your enjoyment of rereads and really just gives you a stronger sense of the world that there's m always more to find and some writers don't create that some of it's very surface it's right here you just said something you just made a freudian slip that i think is awesome that you should make you should make more use of in oh. general you said enjoyment instead of enjoyment <laughs> and hey <laughs> enjoyment <laughs> t-shirt it's going to be a t-shirt <laughs> that's right yes go my latest video guys uh, <laughs> san rixian's on it already i'm sure san rixian please yeah. start making that t-shirt <laughs> it's, it's probably already made she probably heard the comp before i even commented she already like had it half done well what's um, great is that the cartoon that san Reed drew of joe is this like blissfully happy little like overly young youthful kind of looking character so it's very much an enjoyment picture already it's, it's ready to go <laughs> damn it i had a second point to make there but i totally lost it because of this joke that i had the slow first. burn we were talking about the, the slow burn oh too. yeah yeah the slow burn is so true there's um it's it's kind of fits in with what you were saying before how this is a character this is about the characters even though it's in a fantasy story and he does that by like first chapter oh fantasy fantasy fa whoop nope nope no fantasy <laughs> yeah. 
Nope, just, <laughs> just characters, just a family, medieval setting, you know, there's a little bit of hint of fantasy here and there, but nope, family, stories, politics, intrigue, nope, 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 nope. Okay, dire wolves, okay, hold on. Oh, no, nope, 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 nope. Wait, the guy that knows the truth, politics. cutting his head off so nobody believes him. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, so. So he, and he waits just long enough for you to forget about that, and then you have the scene with John finding Jay for Flowers and Othor, and they've got blue eyes, and you just might remember, like, wait a minute, didn't those others have blue eyes in the prologue, or you might not, and then they come to life. And the same thing with the dragon's myth, like, he foreshadows the dragon eggs hatching early on in a Game of Thrones, then has a bunch of crazy stuff happen, Drogo dies and all this, and then the actual, actual hatching of the dragons happens, you've probably forgotten about those dragon dreams by then, because so much crazy shit's gone down, so... It's, it's like homeopathic fantasy, you know, just like 0.1% of the... <laughs> of the <laughs> but you know that 1%'s in there. You know it's there, even though it's a small percentage. But of course it does grow. Obviously by book five, there's a lot more fantasy elements, but it's still centered around the characters, even as the fantasy elements grow. It's just because he's, it's like Joe said, it's a slow burn through five, after five books. That's still a lot of burning after five books, you know, um, even though it's been burning slowly, so... And you said uh, also with your example, uh, LML, about you get like a little tidbit about the doom and you're like, I want more, I want more. And like you said, you kind of forget about it because you're just reading more and, and there's other cool things to think about. And then you get two more sentences about the doom, you know, a book later, you're like, oh, yeah. And by the time you've gone through four or five books, there's like just this huge backlog of little things that you would be excited to get one more sentence about. You know, you, you, there's like a hundred things. If you would just get one more sentence about, it'd be really satisfying. And then you read on and you're like, oh, there's that number, item number 26 I was excited to get one more sentence about. And there's that one sentence. And then 20 pages later, you get a half a sentence about something, you know, it's just, it's constant, yeah. I loved how the exact conversation we're talking about happened between the kindly man and Arya, where he starts telling her about the doom and going into. She's like, "Oh, so like, what actually happened? Who's the the original faceless man?" He's like, ah, nah, 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 nah. "That's not important. We're talking about other stuff right now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, George loves that device. He loves the like the ex incredible mystery explanation being interrupted. Like mm -hmm. when Sam, like Sam, is reading to John, it's like, "Wow, that means the oldest Lord Commander lived long ago." He just interrupts him. He's like, yeah, it's all. It's like, John, shut up, John. Let Sam talk, man. Let's, like, seriously, there's a bunch of us out there that would be like, Sam, like, if a book, if a chapter started, Sam sat down to read the book, and yeah. the book started this way, and the whole chapter was just the book that Sam was reading, we'd be like, yes, that's great. <laughs> See, George published on natural history. I would buy that so fast. I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything by Cologuo Votar. <laughs> <laughs> this is this yeah, jigsaw, please. isn't it? That we have to put together this jigsaw because, like you said, they, we 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 never get the as you know, John. Absolute. <laughs> he even does that to he's, he's like, he hey. never does that. He's like, I left some notes in the jib <laughs> compendium. You know, get to him whenever you feel like it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and he does that with Danny too. Like Jorah gives him those. Yeah. Jorah gives him those songs. We're like, ooh, she still hasn't picked those damn things up. Come on, Danny. And and even George has like said in an interview that those books might be important. You know, like yeah, damn right they might. Well, hurry up with it. <laughs> Show <laughs> us what those books. Danny, pick up the book already. You 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 miss you, you you don't you never been there except for Dragonstone as a kid, and you're really curious about your home. You got books. Read those books. That'll tell you a few things. <laughs> yeah. I something in in passing won't they just so casually like oh yeah it's like the five forts in eastern esos and then they'll just carry and you're whoa what, what just hang on a minute rewind what but it's gone <laughs> because why would they explain that when the assumption is is that we all live in this world you know what the five forts are but us as readers are absolutely ripping our hairs out but it and it's and it's the pacing <laughs> it's it's that teasing and that pulling back and that but we do have the odd chapter that's exposition heavy, but he does know when to leave that out. I feel that those slower chapters, they're like an investment in narrative tension that's because true. you know they're going somewhere, you know? I think one way he really, um, going back to the keep it short part and like how efficient he is with this, um, he almost never has the POV be the person that's the expert in the thing. Like, yeah. Or if they do, they almost never think about it. So when you're hearing about it, you and the character are learning about it at the same time. So you're not just getting like 
pages and pages and pages of exposition of somebody that knows everything. It's somebody just saying, making an offhand comment or uh, somebody asking tearing about dragons. So just for like a few paragraphs, he goes off on about it, but then it's over with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what, may, and Melisandre's chapter is such a huge surprise for that reason, because we're yeah. all like, George, is for long, he said, he's like, oh, you're not gonna get POVs from characters who know too much. You're not gonna get in Littlefinger's head. You're not gonna get in Varys's head. You're not gonna get in even Stannis's head. So I think most of us assumed that Melisandre was in that category. So when she had a chapter, and apparently she's got at least one chapter in The Winds of Winter, we were all like, "Woo!" And that's a great thing that he did, right? He he set us up for that. We were not expecting a chapter from her, and so that made it an awesome surprise when we actually did. Uh, so and she knows uh, about as much as Jon Snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turns out she doesn't actually know that much. She has basically yeah. ex explained glamours, kind yeah, of. <laughs> <pretty much. laughs> so real quick, I just want to say uh, thanks for the super super chat, Stephen Stark, and we'll catch you later. He's got to run. And uh, Misty306 says, Fire and Blood will give us a ton of hints of what to expect in T-Wow and A Dream of Spring, am I right? And I would say yes, and not only yes, but uh, the Princess and the Queen also gave was doing a lot of laying groundwork for the dragon battles to come, in my opinion. Uh, I think George wanted to give us some context for what dragon battles are like before he shows Danny invading Westeros. Uh, because if you look at the dragon battles and the princess and the queen, they all go bad, every one. Uh, there's never any winners. It's most of the dragons and riders die horribly and it's generally a mistake to take them into battle. So I think he really wanted to cut against this idea that like, well, if you have dragons, you just ride out and you win and it's easy, field of fire, that's all there is to it. Uh, like the field of fire was effective, but um, you know, as soon as there's a dragon on each side, it becomes a mess. And so I believe there's a lot of groundwork laid in the Princess and the Queen, and I'd expect more of that to come in Fire and Blood. Would you guys agree? Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Also in the, uh, the his yeah. short story, The Ice Dragon, the, the dragon battle in that is exactly the same. Everybody, Everybody's the worse off for having done it. Yeah, it's it's quite traumatic that one isn't it really the way she just runs off and leaves oh spoilers in case nobody's read it but yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's traumatic it's beautiful and poetic but it's really sad mm. nobody wins like you said nobody wins yeah so so he's he's definitely doing and obviously the the world of ice and fire is full of that stuff there's a ton of stuff in there that he wanted to give us before the next book i mean the whole series of episodes that Aziz and I did on the Great Empire of the Dawn and the Danes and Ashai, uh, the whole idea that ancient dragon lords before Valyrians existed in Ashai, whether they're the Great Empire or not, and then that, that the fact that they came to Westeros, this is a really important thing that we need to key in on before the next two books, and that's why he gave it to us. I think it's perhaps the most important piece of information in the world of Ice and Fire is the few stone fortress on Battle Isle and all the information that goes with that, because it's the whole point, like like we harped on a bunch of times, the Azor High fable and all the Lightbringer stuff is from Ashai. And why does it matter if the story is about Westeros and the Starks? And the answer is that the dragons have tangled with Westeros and the Starks before. And that is what the Long Night Mystery is all about. And so, yeah, he uses these supplementary books and the same with Duncan Egg. Uh, with Blood Raven information, we're going to talk about Blood Raven and the world building that they do uh, that he does with Blood Raven and the Black Fires. So that's another example. Uh, anyways, okay, so let's move on. Uh, some other techniques that George Martin uses that we're going to talk about. He uses world building to foreshadow, and of course, Gemma kind of talked about this already. Um, but uh, they're often one in the same uh, when he's giving you old myths about, for example. The second moon wandering too close to the sun and cracking to pour forth dragons. That's important because at the end of that book, Danny, the moon of Drogo's life, is going to hatch dragons. And so it's not only a myth and it's not only world building, it's also foreshadowing. Uh, I mentioned the idea that Cat um, gives us the story of Durn God's Grief and the building of Storm's End while she's on the way to, at, to that parlay with Stannis and Renly when both of them will be super stubborn. And the whole thing about Aaron's <laughs> God's grief is that he's really fucking stubborn. And so telling you that story right before that parlay greatly enhances 
the characters of Stannis and Renly at the parlay. And I might be screwing that up. It's it's in one of those chapters where Kat is down there visiting Renly. I forget if it's like before she meets Renly or if it's before they go to the parlay itself, but it's it's somewhere in the mix and the point uh, remains. So using world building to foreshadow. Um, and then so moving on uh, in that first quote, uh, George Martin was talking about fantasy. In the first line, he was talking about the language of dream. And the language of dream is really important. Uh, we talked about this in the Not a Cast episode where we went over Brand's coma dream vision. And all of everything that's happening is these short clip sentences. You don't get long descriptions. Uh, it's very confusing. When you're in a dream, nothing really makes sense totally. The seams of reality are very fuzzy. One scene might morph into the next. We're seeing things in symbolic representations like a three-eyed crow taking corn from Bran's hand. Obviously the corn symbolizes like Bran's life force or his seed or something like that. So everything is drenched in metaphor. There's a lot of stuff happening going on. Bran is falling, he's terrified. There's a crow, it's got three eyes. It's talking about this memory that he has of Jamie. He's seeing visions of dragons in the heart of winter. All of this stuff is happening at the same time. And the reason why it works is because he uses the language of dream. The language of dream essentially allows you to maintain the mystery of something like a shy or the three-eyed crow. Uh, if he's just, if Bran was describing it in a waking consciousness, it would strip some of the mystery from it. Uh, but because it's coming at you in these almost incomprehensible visions and fragments, uh, it he's allowed to do world building in a way that isn't heavy handed and obtuse. So that's the language of dream. And then a lot of times the world building actually comes in dreams and visions itself. Um, but even when it doesn't, he still uses that sort of dream language. So um, comments. Another, another way that pattern holds up, if we can call it a pattern, it's more of a technique, but I'm calling it a pattern here because uh, like I've done with several other areas of his work, um, you notice when he does something different. When he breaks that pattern, it stands out. So that's why I'm calling it a pattern. For example, so very often, he the way he includes world building in his chapters is just in a way that you would find to make sense. Like if someone's, like say Davos is at White Harbor, and so you he gets thrown in the, uh, in the Wolf's Den, so we get the history of the Wolf's Den. That makes sense, right? That's, uh, it all fits very nicely. But there's a, occasionally uh, that, that pattern is broken. For example, when Tyrion is heading north with Benjen and Jon to go see the Wall for the first time, he thinks about Targaryen history. He thinks about the Field of Fire and the dragon skulls underneath Castle or underneath the Red Keep, which is not related to where they're at at all. They're walking around the countryside in the north, and he's thinking about dragons. So that's so that is really interesting when he kind of breaks from that pattern. Of course. This is one of the earliest chapters, so it's not necessarily the pattern isn't necessarily established. This is kind of something you notice on a reread, really. Um, but it's it's really cool, and you and you wonder, well, why is he doing that? And well, in retrospect, it has a lot to do with the fact that he's talking to Jon Snow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was about to say <laughs> <laughs> he's talking to Jon about you know it's like a little heritage stuff mixed in there, ice and fire stuff. So you've got the surroundings of ice, so he's got to mix in the dragon stuff. And some of that might actually relate to Tyrion too, but obviously mostly it's about John, if not entirely about John. So that's just really neat the way he, he mixes the history in in a way that is kind of puzzling, but then you're like, oh, it's not puzzling at all. It's just like right down the middle, but it wasn't so obvious because that's like what, like the 15th chapter of the entire series. So hardly anything is like really well settled by that point. I also really like the the perspective from Bran, I think while he's warging summer and he sees the dragon come out of Winterfell. And this is what we're talking about with like yeah. the language of dreams. It's like, was that real? Was that fake? Was, did Bran see that? Was that a vision? And it asks all these interesting questions. And especially when you consider that we're, that we're starting to get more information about Jon and maybe being a Targaryen at this point, it's like, well, dragon in Winterfell. And then there's the story about from uh, how they think there's actually a dragon under Winterfell heating the, the, um, the hot springs and it's all these weird little things that don't make sense in the moment but on a reread you can go back and start piecing together it's like wow he's been talking about like dragons in winterfell for a long 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 time but it's it's all quick and it's not heavy-handed and you need to notice it 
Gemma? Yeah, he does this with symbols and, and motifs and themes as well, doesn't he? This is what Aziz was saying made me think of this, um, that he establishes these very firm patterns, that these are the symbols of this book, these are the motifs. We've got the Iron Throne as a symbol, the direwolves are a symbol, um, themes are love versus duty, facing hard truths and and birds, um, like LML mentioned, that's that's a motif, a hand side to the outsider, that kind of thing. And he establishes those. This is the pattern and he sticks with these. And we can get through several books and these are still there, but then every now and again, he just throws in a new one and it becomes a new thing and it sticks out. But the comet, um, the chaos of war is introduced in A Clash of Kings and it's just so prominent and so obvious that this is a new thing that's been brought in because it, it breaks that pattern that's been previously established. And, and it's really clever because it really brings, like the, the initial Aria chapters in A Clash of Kings, it's really brought forward that the impact that this war is having and obviously relates to the title of the book, but he's still on the original themes and symbols that he's he brought in. He sticks with those. It's like he knows what he started with and he's, he's going to see it through to the end. But he gives us new ones along the way as well. Well said. Go ahead. I was going to say just less about world building, but another example just randomly popped in my head of, of George breaking a pattern that really stands out is... Um, I was just on uh, Indie Geek stream and we talked about horns and there's that Victorian chapter where it just, the end of the chapter, it just suddenly isn't his POV anymore. It just jumps yes. to the, the crew and it's like, whoa, that's really something. And it's yeah. and the effect is really enhanced by the fact that something dark, magical is happening in there. It vaguely reminds us of Danny's uh, giving birth because you hear like the weird sounds coming from, instead of the tent, it's the the whole the cabin that Victorian's in there with the dusky woman and and Makoro, and uh, so that's just yeah like that's not even that's not even world building that's just uh, you know doing something different to really catch our attention and it really working um, especially because Victorian's chapters are like you read his point of view and it's interesting but it's also he's a a dumbass that George is flat out said that. <laughs> You know? as dumb as a stump, so, I think's the quote. <laughs> yeah, dumb as a stump. So you go from and George writes him really well. I'm impressed with how well he writes a character who's dumb as a stump. That's not easy to do. Like George, when George writes Tyrion or Sam, I love it, but I get the sense that it's a little easier for him because he says he's got things in common with these guys, you know. So it's a little, little closer to writing about himself. But George is nothing like Victorian in real life, you know. So like that's he's really got to just like, well, what would it be like if I was as dumb as a stump, really violent, and grew up in this culture, and he does a great job of it. And then yes, yeah, so then when the narrative changes like that, it's like, whoa, hold on, hold on, what's going on here? This is cool. Okay, so hey, uh, Painkiller Jane, uh, to bring things back on topic of world building. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, you got a Z's, bro. Playing. I just playing. Uh, so Painkiller Jane says that Martin's physical world building, landscaping, architecture, etc., is a wonderful foreshadowing tool he uses. He pours in the cultural traits into these to bring the people to life vividly. And uh, good comment, and it, it really called to mind a specific chapter from A Storm of Swords, uh, Sansa, which I've been reading all the Sansa chapters lately because my next episode is going to be the long-awaited Veil vale slash Sansa episode of Moons of Ice and Fire. Uh, in any case, check this out. This is, uh, notice how the Eerie itself um, contributes to the appearance of Lysa Tully, all right? Sansa walked down the blue silk carpet between rows of fluted pillars, slim as lances. The floors and walls of the high hall were made of milk-white marble veined with blue. Shafts of pale daylight slanted down through the narrow arched windows along the eastern wall. Between the windows were torches mounted into high iron sconces, but none of them were lit. Her footsteps fell softly on the carpet. Outside, the wind blew cold and lonely. Amidst, amidst so much white marble, even the sunlight looked chilly somehow, though not half so chilly as her aunt. Lady Lysa had dressed in a gown of cream-colored velvet and a necklace of sapphires and moonstones. Her auburn hair had been done up in a thick braid and fell across one shoulder. She sat in the high seat watching her niece, uh, her niece approach, her face red and puffy beneath the paint and powder. On the wall behind her hung a huge banner, the moon and falcon of House Aaron in cream and blue. Sansa stopped before the dais and curtsied. 
My lady, you sent for me. She could heal, still hear the sound of the wind and the soft chords Marillion was playing at the foot of the hall. So, <clears throat> I mean, Martin literally uh, hands off from the description of the cold, eerie, and the cold sunlight to not as cold as Lysa. And then it's just like right seamlessly into the description of Lysa. So this is exactly what Painkiller Jane was talking about, where the description of the place makes the character really pop. And he does that all the time. And uh, it almost would seem heavy handed, but it's don't be afraid to do this. I mean, this is fantasy. It's supposed to be, again, azure and lapis lazuli and stuff. And even using the sapphires here makes you think of the others as, as well as the milk white veined with blue thing, because obviously the blood, uh, the others have blue blood and stuff. So it's yeah, pretty good. Add another hundred feet to that wall. Just do it. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever you're making. Add another. And uh, have a, a second super, helping. Couple super chats real quick. Uh, Kelly Morlock says she's really enjoying everyone's intelligent discussion and passion for a song of ice and fire. Sending some love. Thanks, Kelly. And Mandolin five twenty three says always. Thank you all for your contributions. Great content. Keep saying the slow burn flickering and keeping the slow mm -hmm. burn flickering. I appreciate you all and cannot tell you enough. So thank you guys. And thanks uh, everyone in the chat with great comments. Uh, we are hovering around 190 watchers. And I bet if like few of you go and share this link on social media, maybe we'll get up to 200. But I That'd am be cool. super grateful for that, uh, that amount of attendance. That's awesome. So thanks, guys. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I'll get a wig. I try to keep the wigs to the mythical astronomy stuff because see, this is between two weirwoods is a very serious show. We're kind of like an NPR thing, you know. We got the flamenco <laughs> guitar super and serious. Uh, super, very serious. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we, we we talk about weed, uh, pipe weed, and <laughs> enjoy. Very serious. <laughs> Oh, how much we? Sorry, I, I said that wrong. It's how much we enjoy pipe weed. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Too much. much. Oh, stay out of the dark woods when you smoke. I did have a point, but you've disrupted my flow now. <laughs> uh, it, it was probably about that passage of the chilly sunlight and the Sansa stuff. Is that jogger memory? Oh yeah, no. Um, I was thinking um, the the comment that was made about um, the the buildings and the environment. Um, this also works with the abandoned settlements, doesn't it? That John sees beyond the wall. Danny visits this uh, strange, abandoned, dead and decayed village and um, Arya as well in the Riverlands. This is um, throughout A Clash of Kings. And it's and it's like, it, it's, it's thematically showing you again this chaos of war that I was speaking about earlier on, but in the same breath, it's world building and it's teasing us with these hints that here's something that went down. I'm not gonna tell you what it was. But it did, and it was really macabre and gruesome. But moving on swiftly, and you're like, but, but why is why are there skulls that have been bleached white by the sun? Who were these people? What did they do? What was their culture? But we get none of these answers. So it's it's world building, it's foreshadowing, it's themes and symbols, it's it's everything all wrapped into one, and it's a big massive tease, like you said earlier, LML. Just gives us just enough to keep us wanting more and more all the time. Cool, so, um, well, uh, this isn't exactly going uh, along the schedule that I thought it would. I thought that everything we had done up till now would be like half an hour, uh, and, and, and then we'd go into exam more specific examples, but whatever, it's been great, so that's fine. But we do have uh, some specific examples of world building uh, set aside to sort of mention and demonstrate uh, how how he does this so efficiently. So uh, first one that I want to start with is the the moon meteor theory. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing? How much have you ever heard that one before? No, I don't need to explain it. You already know the moon meteor theory. Um, <laughs> no, what I'm, I actually already made most of the points I want to make, which is why I brought this up, just so I can sort of uh, see what I'm saying. So we get, it's based on four different things. It's based on, and this is like my entire moon media theory. The, the crux of it is based on four instances of raw world building. There's the original old man story about the others, the last hero, and the long night. There's the Carthine myth about the second moon wandering too close to the sun and pouring forth dragons. That's about three paragraphs. 
the uh, the story of the others in the long night is about three paragraphs also. Then there's the Lightbringer myth in A Clash of Kings that Salador San says to Davos. That's about three paragraphs. And there's the Melisandre prophecy of Zor Hai being reborn under a bleeding star. Uh, and that's only one paragraph. And that's it. So between those bits and pieces of world building, you can figure out that there's two myths talking about a moon cracking, that dragons and comets have something to do with each other, and that the long night is tied to something about the moon cracking and comets and dragons coming from a moon that cracks some or something. And from that, you can basically put together the beginning of the theory, which is that some shit went down in the sky. There were some meteors that rained down, and that is what caused the darkness of the long night. And you can start to think about dawn and uh, being made from a fallen star, which is also like two lines of dialogue. Literally, dawn is made from the heart of a fallen star. That's it. No other explanation. And then you can start to be like, oh, wait a minute. Dawn sounds, it's a glowing sword made from a meteor, and you can start to run wild with it. So this is all efficiently done in the first like two books in three paragraphs, one paragraph at a time. So that's, I just wanted to highlight that because it's super efficient. Um, and uh, what's really fascinating is the first instance, which is the old Nan story about the others and the last hero. I reread this whole chapter uh, a couple days ago. And it blew my mind the effectiveness of the world building here. So let me just walk you through this chapter really quick. Um, I made notes here that'll just go through bullet by bullet. So it starts with Bran, who's just awakened from his coma in like the last chapter or two. So he's up in the tower. He's alone. He's crippled. He's sitting in the bed. He's hanging out with old Nan and he's watching Rickon run around in the yard and play with the wolves. And he's watching people train in the yard and do all the stuff that involves walking, which you can't do anymore. Uh, yeah, so there's, your, there's, your, there's your requisite LML pantomime. So <laughs> first thing we get is the heart in conflict. Bran is a crippled boy who wanted to be a knight, and now he can't walk. So already this is jerking tears from us. And he doesn't want to hear stories from old Nan, and old Nan sarcastically offers to tell him a story about a kid who didn't like stories. That's where it's at, okay? So then... She offers to talk about Brandon the Builder, and she's like, oh, those were always your favorite, Brandon the Builder. And then Bran goes on a little inner monologue, one paragraph, and he's like, oh, yeah, Brandon the Builder. He built Winterfell and perhaps the Wall. And so that's world building there. You're like, oh, Brandon the Builder built the Wall and Winterfell. But then he quickly says, those weren't my favorite stories. I don't like those stories. So you're, you're right back to the heart in conflict and the idea that Bran is now arguing with old Nan, which we've never seen before. So this is distracting us from the world building. Then she's like, well, perhaps you'd like a scarier story about the others <laughs> and the long night. And then he's like, well, <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah, I, I do like those. And so then we get the long night last hero story. And that's about only, again, three paragraphs. And it's, it's very dramatic. It's entertaining. So it's actually world building, but it's super entertaining. And then it's interrupted because uh, Tyrion has just arrived back from the wall and he's passing back through Winterfell. Then we get the scene where um, Rob lays his sword out across his lap and he's too harsh to Tyrion and the wolves come out of the shadows and sort of scare him and knock him down. And then he offers the saddle. So again, we're right back to heart and conflict. Bran's the, the theme of the chapter that we started with. Bran can't walk. Tyrion's now offering help. Uh, this situation is also super conflicty because we empathize with both Tyrion and the Starks at this point in the book. And so George is putting these two people that we like and having them fight with each other. So our, we're conflicted and the characters are conflicted. Then uh, we get, following that, uh, we get the news that Benjen is missing. And that's more hard and conflict stuff because Rob and Bran are very upset about it. And then Bran ties the last hero myth that we got earlier in the chapter back by saying, oh, well, the children of the forest, they help the last hero, they'll help Benjen. And so now we're given this really important clue about the last hero, that he was helped by the children of the forest, which many people have made many theories about. Uh, but it's tied into the drama of the story of Benjen being missing. So there's a lot of the elements that we talked about earlier on display in this chapter. And it's like, not only do we get the last hero story, we also get a little bit more Brandon the Builder world building, uh, we get stuff about the others in The Last Hero. And all of it is framed inside of Bran's heart in conflict. So I just thought that was like a stupendous example 
of the stuff we're talking about. And this is, again, halfway through the first book. So Martin was already good at this and only got better as time went on. So I'll, I'll uh, pass it back to you guys with that. That's a really good way to put it. And um, a really good uh, kind of rounded out uh, way of breaking it down. I had touched on this a little earlier um, with like kind of how he does a has a pattern in some of his chapters with the way he uses world building. And of course, it's it's not a hard and fast pattern. Not every pat chapter follows this pattern, but you see this, this structure loosely speaking quite often, which is uh, using the North Remembers chapter with Davos as an example, because this is a chapter I've, I've paid particular attention to in a lot of ways. It starts off with where is Davos? Ah, he's at the Wolf's Den. Okay, what's the Wolf's Den? World building, world building, world building. We, we, we learn about the Wolf's Den. And then the most of the chapter from there is resolving that. He interacts with this setting that we've now, he's, he's interacted with a little bit. Now that we've gotten a full history on it, it's the, re the, the major interactions come. He has a conversation with Sir Bartimus. He thinks about how he's going to die. And uh, that's the conflict, you know, with himself, uh, how he's got to say goodbye to his family and write a letter to his wife and and do all this other stuff and lament his choices, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, it gets surprising. Things happen, different things happen. But all throughout that, you've got the same world building elements. You've got stuff that was before that chapter. We learned about White Harbor and who the Mandalays were long before that chapter. So there's a lot of uh, buildup already, a lot of things that we didn't necessarily know where they were going. Like, we didn't know that the Manderleys would be important, you know, in, a, in the way that they are back in books one, two, and even three. They hadn't really done a whole lot. But it all, but it makes sense that, oh, of course, White Harbor. It's one of the few cities in the entire, uh, in all of Westeros. And it's in the north. It's where most of the people are. Of course, it makes sense that someone would eventually go there and interact with the setting, and then we would learn more about it. And uh, <clears throat> so it's another, that's a perfect example. He's in conflict with himself, the heart, his heart in conflict because of where he is. And while he's there, he naturally thinks about this place that he's in, and uh, we get information about it. Um, and another thing I want to point out, just as an aside to all that, something that's been percolating in my mind is just how, just the evidence of, of how we as fans respond to his world building, uh, which is that, just from my own experience as a creator, um, the, two, the most popular videos that we've ever done were about the Battle of Ice and the Battle of Fire, which... That makes sense. It's uh, it's what's coming. People want to know about the Winds of Winter, and the most exciting stuff is in material we haven't gotten yet in a lot of ways. But the next most popular things are like the Ash Eye video and Great Empire of the Dawn, stuff that's all basically mostly world building, right? Like Ash Eye <laughs> is important, but it's mostly world building, right? It's we're, like, like David said, we're not going to go to Ash Eye. We might get some flashbacks of it, but Ash Eye itself, the place isn't as important as the things that came from it that are impacting characters thousands of leagues away. And, uh, but we're still really fascinated by Asha, even though we all know it has very little to do with the story. So I think that's just, um, it just proves how George has managed to capture our imagination on things that we know aren't quote unquote important to us. They're important because we like them and that makes them important. But so important, you know, kind of means different things in this context, but I think y'all get the gist of that. Yeah, it's, it makes it's way more Ladies important that a shy. I'm, oh. I'm sorry, Joe Magician. I'm sorry, but we've reached 205 viewers. Oh my god! And oh. uh, we've got to give the people what they want, which is apparently Raygarth Barbarian, as Sanrixian has named <laughs> this look. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, but uh, by all means, carry on with your very serious. Uh, I was gonna. Say <laughs> Wow. How, um, how can we now? That's just. I, uh, I was gonna say that it's it's more important that a shy exists as a place and what it means for the background of the story than what it actually is. Like, I'm sure like the streets of a shy are not as interesting as the fact that it symbolizes this great fallen empire and what it means for especially like characters like the Danes. And I was gonna I wanted to talk about your um example of the wolf's den really quick. Just the name itself. How clever will world building that is. He names it the Wolf's Den, so you're instantly you're thinking, well, not only is this a Stark place, but this is a safe place for the Starks. That this is, that whoever owns this place probably has their best um, their best intentions at heart. And then you start to see, like, the man, like, from Manderley, it looks like he's gonna kill 
Davos and all this stuff, but in the back of your head, creating more of a conflict using world building, you're like, but it's named the the Wolf's Den. How could somebody who owns the Wolf's Den in this world be somebody that would do something this horrible that would side with the Lannisters in the phrase? And it ends up paying off within the same chapter. True that. Uh, Gemma, we're getting some comments about your uh, hair blowing gloriously in the wind, so I just wanted to relate those to you. <laughs> and also, uh, Stan Rixian has uh, offered, uh, kindly offered a 15% discount over at sanrixian.com. You can use the code LML and get 15% off any shirt. So run on over there. You can surely buy a t-shirt and still listen to the stream at the same time. Good deal. You can, Good deal. You can get this cool yeah, North Remember awesome. shirt, or you can get the cool Leanna t shirt. And uh, yeah, we're all waiting for the uh, Enjo, Enjo Pipeweed shirt. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not sure I want to see the picture for that. We, we pretty much in, <laughs> we design a new San Rixian t shirt every time we live stream at this point. Uh, so. All right, uh, cool. So very cool example. The Wolf's Den. I love the Wolf's Den. The world building there is exceptional. And, uh, you know, there's. I listened to the chapter right before Davos gets to the Wolf's Den uh, yesterday. And uh, this is the one where he actually ends up on Sisterton, on Sweet Sister. And this is a really cool chapter for world building because we haven't heard from Davos since the Storm of Swords. And the chapter opens with Martin's standard in late out early technique. It starts off with Davos marching from the damp, dank prison at Sweet Sister up to speak to Lord Borel, who's the guy that has the webbed fingers. And he basically is an upjumped pirate lord uh, ruling uh, Sweet Sister. And so as Davos, all that physically happens in the chapter is that Davos walks from some point in between the prisons and the palace to the palace and have, has a conversation with Lord Borel. That's it. That's all that happens in this chapter. But what actually happens is you get the entire story of what happened to Salador San's fleet after they left the wall. There was this storm, 29 ships blown apart. Some landed on Skagos with the horny goats and some will never be seen again. And some are down in Davy Jones' locker with the sea dragons and the Merlin King and whatever. And then we get the story of uh, the, the three sisters, how they've been fought over by the Eerie in the North and the rape of the three sisters is the name of something that happened there apparently that sounds really awful we get the the idea that the, the three sisters have been haunts of pirates and smugglers for centuries and centuries we then start to hear a little bit about the wolf's den and the manderleys we actually get the first part of the story about how the manderleys were evicted from the reach and how the northmen took them in and took their gold but let them keep their silver and they set themselves up to be rich lords on the mouth of the mander that whole story is in this chapter we even get a little bit of mythology where we get the whole Lord of the Skies, Lady of the Waves duality that the Sisterton people believe in, the Mark of the Borels, which implies them as fish people. So there's a little squisher talk. All of this happens in this chapter, but Martin does the world building so smoothly that it's like, I mean, if you, if you set out a writing exercise to do this, it would be ridiculous. It's like, write a chapter where the only action that happens is a guy walks up some steps and then has a conversation with somebody. And put do all these things at the same time and put all this information in there. So I invite you guys go back after this episode and re-listen to that chapter and just sort of like notice all the world building and notice how smoothly he does it and notice the techniques that he uses to do it. So it, it's really great. I want to add to that too, because th there's something in that particular chapter that really gets me that I think is awesome. And it's, it's, it's slightly, it's, it's world building, but it's really, really small detail, which is, and it's something that because, like you said, there's this chapter is all mostly conversation. He walks from the, the prison to the castle or whatever. Um, but he also describes that he's wet and cold and he has that bowl of stew, the sister stew that just sounds really, really delicious. And, it, and Davos, the way Davos describes when he's eating it, it's like filling him and making him warm from the cold. And that's something that almost anyone can relate to, you know, and um, a lot of stuff that happens in the story we can't relate to all that much because it's the setting is so different and uh you know we don't have swords and dragons in our world well, we have swords but we don't have them all over the place and uh <clears throat> any just anyone can kind of 
uh, connect with a hot bowl of soup on a cold, rainy day. I mean, that's just, you know, in the midst of all this kind of fantastical history and all this war and stuff that, it, you know, is very alien, but awesome. You get this, this, this thing that feels very familiar. And I think that's like that. It's kind of like an anchor to, to normalcy. And I think that's really good. And I think that's it, maybe that's not appropriately called world building, but I think it is because it's the soup is very specifically tied to the location. You know, it's a it's a fish chowder made on an island that subsists on fishing. It's just uh, yeah, it makes sense. <clears throat> uh, and that's actually another great thing is so that whole bit with the soup is a great example of world building because it's called Sister's Stew and it's this hearty stew. But he gives this dissertation about the different kinds of crabs that are in there. And he's like, well, I won't eat spider crabs except for in sister stew. And he points to his sigil, which is a spider crab. Uh, but the spider crabs look a lot like the white ice spiders. And so there's actually a whole tinfoil theory been spawned about the spider crabs and the others based largely on this passage and a couple other passages. Uh, Joe's, Joe's like, oh, tinfoil, I haven't heard of. <laughs> yep. <laughs> based on the sigil? Yep. <laughs> Joe's going to start paying it. more attention to the food descriptions now. Yeah. <laughs> so. The the spider the you spider know crabs is so good. Yeah, well, I'll explain it to you later, but it's it's pretty good stuff. In any case, even the the sort of most relatable thing in there, which is this hearty soup, you know, stew, um, has like interesting world building because it's even implying uh, Borel as a fish person because he's like, I feel such an affinity with these crabs of my sigil that I literally won't eat them. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of funny and amusing and endearing. I, I, and, well, it's also because of how much, you know, Westeros, Westeros identifies with their sigils and how, like, Lyria talks about how, yo, you Westeros, you take your sigils so seriously, you know, but, uh, and how, like, but that's bit, but it's true. It's part of the culture. Westeros, like, everyone identifies with their sigil animal or whatever they like, because their father did and their grandfather did and their grandmother did and all these people. It's, it's pretty ingrained in that, and that's world building, right? That's just the culture that exists in Westeros is people identify with those, they take that stuff seriously. They're, it's like following a sports team. <laughs> but, it's part of your, but it's in your family for thousands of years instead of you know oh, i like this team <laughs> i love that we can get entire tinfoil theories literally from a single sentence within these <laughs> it, it, it's it's in, it's incredible really um you guys have got such great very specific examples of world building there i i what i'd really like to do um is is basically to reel off a broader spectrum. Um, it, oh, it, this is almost a list of things that I jotted down last night. I was thinking about this and I jotted down something and then I went and watched Netflix and then, oh yeah, there's this. And I came back and I jotted something down and this just went on all night long because it, things just kept popping into my mind and it's all these little things. Yeah, just, uh, take over, take it over, do it. Give us, right, give okay. us a full rundown. Okay, um, it, it, it's everywhere. It, it's every sentence, it's every word, it's every passing mention, every fleeting thought, it's the unusual flower with the strange scent and the unusual colour that we later discover was used to create a poison that killed a king at his wedding. Um, it's the culture of a particular religion and that lends itself to the characters that come from that particular region, um, such as the nightly traditions of the Reach and House Tyrell, and we're getting an idea of the kind of characters that we can expect from that region. Um, it's, I mean, I've, I've Googled, is lamprey pie a real food, for example? You know, this is the thing, <laughs> this is the things that we end up doing. Um, I've done comparative analysis of the wall and real life skyscrapers. I'm sure you all have comparing the heights to see if this is, if this is, I can see Joe has done this. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> I, I like it when the scientists talk about like how the wall is impossible and they're like talking about the physics of it. That's where I hear about it. <laughs> and George <laughs> is like, uh, magic. Uh. George is just like, yeah, I probably made it too high. Anyways, next subject. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> but anything that turns out to not be real in this world, it, it does have a foundation. It's got a basis somewhere, hasn't it? It's got a reference that we can unearth. Um, the Black Goat of Cahor, um, that's Lovecraftian and Battle on the Pale Child, Wildfires, Greek Fire, Valyrian Steel, Damascus Steel. Um, Westeros has got its own Black Death. It's got the Great Spring Sickness. Um, it's the style of clothing, like Daenerys wears the dress that has her breast out and that forwards the 
um, character of Joro and that whole kind of friend zone relationship that they've got going because she realizes that he's not exactly maintaining eye contact at that particular moment in time. But the world building's there because it's the culture of the dress and the style. Um, it's jewelry that then becomes a weapon. It's the weapons and the armor of different cultures. Um, I've got so many on this list. Um, what I do have um, is a lot of nicknames. I love the nicknames of the characters. And, th and that itself, because they're not, not I don't, I'm not talking about titles. I'm talking about nicknames. I'm talking about Barrist and the Bold, the Hound, the Old Bear, Great John, Small John, the Blackfish, the Red Viper, the Mountain that Rides. Stick some in the comments if you can think of any, because I have a very small list here. Brienne the Beauty, Raph the Sweetling, the King Beyond the Wall, the Lightning Lord, Lord Too Fat to Sit a Horse, Kingslayer, Queen of Thorns, Dragon Knight, Young Wolf, the Imp, the Mad King, the Spider, Dark Star. I haven't even started on Arya. And this just goes on and on and on. There's hardly a single character. In, there's one, Sam the Slayer. There's hardly a single character in this series that doesn't have at least two names. At least. Can you think of any more guys? Uh, they call no. <laughs> Lord Snow quite a lot, mockingly, but it ends yeah. up happening. A yes, bit of, ex exactly. Mm, they end up coming true quite a lot. Yeah, Lyria's got some good names. Uh, yellow rotting sea cow uh, is one of my favorite <laughs> ones. Um, Child longer. Snow Knight. Child Snow Knight. That's a good oh, one. There you go. Uh, so real quick, I just want to say that Painkiller Jane just dropped the link to Evil A's Spider Crabs theory, which she's not even sure that she believes in anymore. But it is a good write-up. So, <laughs> Joe, a magician, if you're curious, it is in there in the chat. Just awesome. Uh, some good like, reading. Yeah. About for your for your future enjoyment. <clears throat> <laughs> I'll be here all the week. So Gemma, carry on. Yeah, I've got a couple more. Um, something that sprung to mind was, and you'll like this one, is the constellations. The fact that not only are there constellations in this world, but they have names. But George R. Martin doesn't even stop there. He gives the same constellations different names depending on what culture is looking at them. And then we have a whole situation where John and Egret are having a conversation and it's so telling about their relationship, the foreshadowing of where that's going, of their different cultures. But it's, it's again, it's this world that has stars and constellations that do have names and a reason behind it. The sheer amount of detail that George R. Martin puts into these books is, it's just astonishing. Um, we've got wine but we have regions that are famous for wine and we have particular vintages of wine. We don't just have, oh, there's some good wine from this place. It's far more nuanced than that. Um, animals and plants that can only be found in certain places, butterflies that kill the visitors to that place, <laughs> which is like, we need more on this. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Davos it, does. Yeah, absolutely. Does. <laughs> <laughs> um, monuments that are just randomly in some overgrown region somewhere and we have no reason why basically if we accompany all of these tiny things and just build up this huge picture it just makes for such a rewarding reading experience doesn't it and this is why we love george r r martin i'm done with my list you can go <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it kind of builds on some of the points we we're making earlier about how it comes in drips and drabs and it's a slow burn uh, these these little things are scattered throughout, and eventually, you know, you give someone a nickname, you put them in an interesting place, or the first time you see them, the setting they're in is frequently designed to enhance their character. Like Cold Hands, the first time he appears, he comes from beneath the trees, quote unquote. And this is language which implies, makes you think of green seers sitting beneath the trees. And uh, that's just one of those little keywords I picked up on. But similar with Lysa, you know, you're presented with Lysa sitting in the cold throne room. Uh, so, uh, yes, these these little things all add up and it, it creates world building. So real quick, I just want to say something. We are almost at two hours right at two o'clock here or uh, two o'clock my time. I guess it's five Eastern. Uh, so my friend Azora Hype is about to go live and he's going to be doing a uh, live stream about the fate of House Lannister in season eight. So that would be a TV based show. So if you guys are interested in that feel free to catch the rest of this on replay and go over to kyle's stream 
and we're probably only going to go another like 10 or 15 minutes anyway. Uh, and then uh, he'll be he'll be live there. So I just wanted to give him a quick shout out. We've coordinated with each other so as to try to not have streams at the same time and step on each other's toes too much because there's generally only so many people in the world looking for a th uh, Game of Thrones live streams on any given day. So, you know, we sure. try not to step on each other's. All of us content creators kind of do that, to be honest. We do coordinate and look out for each other as much as possible. So don't uh, step on each other's webbed toes. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so just to sort of uh, build towards the end here and wrapping things up, that I did want to bring up the Black Fires and Blood Raven because this is such a good example of sneaky world building. And Aziz has been uh, doing a deep dive on Blood Raven lately. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit on on that, Aziz? Sounds good. Yeah. So. The way George, this is this is not only does this speak to world building, it also speaks to George's style as a writer, which is, as we know, there's the whole architect versus gardener thing. And so what George does is if you're a clever gardener, you garden things in a way that you don't write yourself in a corner. You give yourself options for later. For example, right now, George could go either way on Tyrion's parentage. Well, some of us would hate it if he made Tyrion the son of Ares. Some of us would be fine with it. Some of us would be like, eh, and shrug. The fact is, it's set up whether he wants to do it or not. He can go either way. And the fact is it's just not settled. So a, a good example of, of, of this comes in very early in a Game of Thrones. John has his first real heart to heart with Maester Aemon where Aemon reveals he's a Targaryen. At this point is when we learn that sometime in the back in, the, in history, eventually we get precise dates, but at, in, you know, way in the, back then he didn't give precise dates. We hear that there was a king named Aegon who had a brother named Aemon, the Dragon Knight, and there was some doubt as to which of them fathered uh, Daron, um, the, the, the good. This is world building, kind of like that Tyrion chapter I mentioned before, because it's also speaking to John's hidden heritage. But it's also directly related to Aemon, because Aemon is referring to people that he directly descended from. Daron was his grandfather. The, the person that this mysterious parentage was related to. And so, and, in, and even before that, George introduced the Three-Eyed Crow. The Three-Eyed Crow makes an appearance before this, this conversation with John and Eamon. And it turns out the Three-Eyed Crow is Bloodraven. But at the time, George hadn't given him that name Bloodraven. He had just decided, okay, what George had decided was that he was a Targaryen bastard or had Targaryen blood and that he had been alive for a long time, and a few other small details, but he hadn't given him a name. He hadn't given him a family besides the Targaryen part. He hadn't filled out that family. He hadn't filled out that backstory. But now, years later, we have this guy's name. We have his brothers and sisters and family and the setting he was in. We have all of their stories. We have all of their relatives. We have all of their houses that they're connected to. We have an entire story starting from the beginning of his life all the way till he goes to the wall. And then a whole nother story once he gets to the wall and somehow gets into a tree in between all that. And this is all there and it's all awesome. And it's all fascinating. And it's pretty much all in between. It's pretty much all you have to read between the lines to get 90% of it and uh, or read the backstory, read, you know, read the world of ice and fire or read the extended material. And, and when you put it all together, it, it creates this like second story within the story. And, uh, there's so much out of that you can glean to, for the future of A Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, Blood Raven's story is filled with parallels. I can't even go into it all. Um, you'll have to check out my episodes. But uh, there's just so much. Like I touched on earlier, Blood Raven dealt with the same prophecies that Rhaegar dealt with that now Danny and John are in the midst of. So it's, and, and Melisandre, all these characters. So it's really, it's, it's beautiful how well it fits together and how well if you look at all these details you don't find any you, you pretty much don't find mistakes you're like oh george kind of screwed this one up here it didn't you know this kind of kind of contradicts itself and uh because he's because there's no narrator you never get you, you can never uh, he's able to mask some of that behind uh our POV for the story, which is that we don't know what the truth is. We don't know what the real story is because we're all just in the world like the characters are and there's no narrator telling us. So if it seems like something is contradictory, that's just a matter of perspective. You know, we don't ever have narrative conflict in terms of all knowing things being contradictory. So I think that's just really awesome the way it builds from this little tidbit of a story between 
Bran and the Three-Eyed Crow and then John talking to Maester Aemon and somehow all of that filling out into a whole world full of other characters and histories and backstories, all of which you can just spend hours and hours on and not run out of material to play with. Yeah, I, I really like the way that um, the Blackfire buildup is such a slow burn until all of a sudden we meet Fagon and the Golden Company and it just pops out. Uh, and the same thing with Bloodraven, you know, it's like we hear these whisperings and all of a sudden you get this character. And really, like, if you haven't read Duncan Egg, Bloodraven doesn't pop quite as much. Um, but when you've read Duncan Egg uh, and then you and then Bloodraven appears on the page, then it's really friggin uh, something. Especially so, if you yeah, read, when you yeah, when he had that. Saga. Oh, yeah. If, and you, when you read, I've watched you for, for a long time with A Thousand Eyes and One. It was like, oh, <laughs> Thousand Eyes and One, that's unmistakable. No one, that is way too specific to be anybody else. And then there's all these other clues that confirm it. And yeah, that's just a, I remember that moment reading that. That was just like, oh, boy, that's cool. <laughs> Even Elio and Linda like stopped, jumped up to like make a tweet about that. Like, oh, Thousand Eyes and One. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> really cool. And then uh, jo another thing that I wanted to touch on before we wrap up is, uh, Joe, we wanted to talk about the idea of Martin as a short story writer, uh, mm -hmm. because this really contributes to Martin's efficiency, like kind of the underlying theme with everything that we're talking about is that the world building is done very efficiently and it's done in certain ways. And Martin often extols the virtues of writing short stories when he's giving, again, writing advice to young writers. He's saying, start by writing short stories because it teaches you how to give someone a backstory quickly uh, and not spend a bunch of time uh, building crystal castles in the sky, as I like to say. Uh, but, you know, in a short story, you've got to get right to business with these emotional conflicts right away. So, Joe, you actually wanted to pull from some of Martin's short stories and make a couple of points. And by all means, why don't you do that? I was going to talk about uh, three of them, but because we're short on time, I'm just going to talk about the most important one. And that is one of his early short stories called with morning comes mistfall. And the basic setting of the story is it's in a thousand worlds, it's sci-fi, and there's this planet called Wraith World. And even from, just from the name, like we were talking about with like the wolf's den, it, it almost sounds something like Disneyland. It sounds like a theme park. And then you find out that's what it is. What happened when humans first came to this world is some of the early explorers were killed by these things that they, people call wraiths. They're not quite sure what they are. And, you know, there's horror story things about how, like, they went crazy and this person's found mutilated over here. So people keep coming to this world trying to find the wraiths. And it becomes a, um, it's a cottage industry. That's the only thing that works on this planet. And the really interesting thing about it is the mistfall is what happens is the entire world is um, shrouded in mists that rise and fall. And you're talking about crystal castles. There basically is one. It's called Castle Cloud. It sits right at the top of where the mists come up in the mornings, where so you can see mountains poking up, and then it comes back down. And a large part of the point of the story is um, what we've been talking about, the mystery of, of storytelling and not getting all the information, keeping your readers wanting more. And I think there's an excellent quote from this, because this ends up being... Uh, a key part of the story. A scientist and a journalist have come to Wraith World in order to discover what the true wraiths are. They end up finding, spoiler alert for uh, <laughs> when morning comes this fall, they find out they're nothing, that they don't exist. But, have a second, let me pull this up. Okay, here we go. So here's the quote from the journalist to the, to the man named Sanders who runs the castle. It says, if Duboski answers all the questions, then there will be no reason to come here anymore, and you'll be put out of business. Are you sure that's why you're so worried? Sanders glared at me. I thought he was going to hit me for a second, but he didn't. I thought you were different. He looked at Miss Fall and understood. I thought you did anyway, but I guess I was wrong. You jerked his head to the door. Get out of here. And that's sort of his attitude towards uh, the world building, and you can see that all throughout A Song of Ice and Fire. He's asking you to buy in, and he's asking you not to really find all the answers. He's not hes not going to tell you them. He wants you to come along with him and create a conversation with the reader and give you more to find. Because once you find out what the wraiths are, once you find out what the children are, once you find out what happened to 14 Flames and the intricacies of the Grimpire of the Dawn, then 
the illusion is broken because that's what happens at the end of the story with the race proved non-existent the world just turns uh wraith world gets renamed and it turns into basically just a industrial world like all the others all the other thousand worlds and something that was wonderful in the thousand worlds is now gone no no <laughs> Well, there's 999 more worlds. Yeah. <laughs> the Harangan worlds are still out there to find, but. Yeah, that, I, love, I love that. I really love that a lot. And, and I think how many times have we said, we're probably not going to get the answer to this, but that's not going to stop us speculating and debating and exploring. I, I think you're right that there's so much of this act. We think we, we think we want to know, but. No, not really. It'd be boring. Yeah, exactly. It would. It would. What we're doing right now is the fun part, that we're discussing yeah. all the possibilities. And I actually think it's kind of funny. And taking this story was written, I think, back in the 70s. It was a very early one for him. And then you hear all the stories from him going to conventions and people asking him questions and him refusing and giving answers on things. Like, this story is why. He, does, yeah. he really doesn't want you to know everything that's going on because... That's he knows the, better than we yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it's better that we don't. That's yeah. why he says keep reading. That's yeah. that's that's when when uh, that's the point of the of that short story. Keep reading. It's more interesting if you find out organically than if he just tells you. That, right. That's quite beautiful. Yeah. The nice thing about uh, is that nobody can leak George Martin's inner thoughts or his draft that he does on his very old computer, which is probably not connected to the internet. Uh, right? Doesn't he work on some super old word, word processor? Star, yeah. yeah, okay, so. Oh, just because they're asking in the chat real quick. Um, this comes from Dream Songs, Volume 1 and 2. If you want to pick those up, they're excellent. You can see a lot of his early work. There's a huge amount of connections with A Song of Ice and Fire because he's been workshopping A Song of Ice and Fire for like 30, 40 years now. And this totally. is where they all come from. But that one in particular. And a lot of them, yeah, yeah, and a lot of them connect to each other. If you really, if you're a fan of world building you not only get george's world building spread across a bunch of different short stories but you see like like joe said you see those echoes in a song of ice and fire you see a lot of like those the early versions of concepts he used much later all over it really just so many good examples of that and it's just fun you know like it's short stories you know you got a uh, 20 minutes to kill in a waiting room or something. Uh, you got a 30 page short story. You can read Sand, Sand Kings. I just read Night Flyers. I just read both of those recently. Those are so Night, good. Flyers, Night Flyers took maybe an hour to read at most, mm -hmm. you know, and Sand Kings probably a half hour. You know, they're, they're not big, deep dives, but you get that sense of, oh, this is George R. R. Martin. You know, you get you feel that it's like, oh, I recognize this. <laughs> so uh, that's it's fun. Yeah, I highly recommend them, too. Sand Kings, especially, it's such an odd concept that he's working with in that story, but he gets you there. It, like you said, it's only like a 10, 15 minute read, but you, yeah. by the end of it, you understand the Sand Kings, you understand the world where they came from and what the point of it was. And it's like, how did he do that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really like, cool. It feels like it's one that. chapter from a huge novel and it's, it's really short. It's unbelievable. It's really good. <laughs> Yeah, and basically any of those short stories are great master classes on world building uh, because he's in a phone booth. I mean, it's there's only a little bit of space. So he's got to build the entire world or at least the important parts of it uh, with the efficiency, uh, just the utmost efficiency, I guess you'd say. So, yeah, the short stories are a great example of how world building is done. And it's definitely workshopping. He's definitely workshopping a lot of a song of ice and fire ideas that's what's funny is that you can see the genesis of of things like the others and leanna stark with her blue rose and all this stuff so those are good recommendations all right well i think that about does it for today we probably could do another two hours easily on world building <laughs> just pulling different examples and and showing it how but basically next time you do any rereads of a song of ice and fire just just uh think just think about all the stuff that we talked about and watch for Martin's world building and see how he does it. And it'll just, you know, it, these are good lessons for writing. If you're going to do any writing of fiction, science, fi, 
or science fi, science fiction, science fi. <laughs> <clears throat> steampunk, <laughs> steampunk holographic cool. goth horror anime or whatever it was that I made up earlier. So he's written all of those. <laughs> yeah, these are. We could go with sci fantasy. Yeah. Sci fantasy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, in any case, thanks for coming, guys. And like I said, Azora Hype is just going live now over on his channel talking about season eight and the fate of House Lamster. So if you're into that, go over and check it out. Tell him I said hi. And I will be seeing you next with a regular episode of Mythical Astronomy. Thank you so much to all of my guests. This has been a ton of fun, as I knew it would be. And uh, starting with Gemma, tell everyone where to find us and tell everyone what you got coming. Um, I've got Unraveling the Text coming because I'm going to get lynched if I don't get a move on with that. Um, yeah, I'm Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. I'm Gemma Secrets on Facebook. I'm at Citadel Secrets on Twitter and I'm Secrets of the Citadel on Instagram. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to discuss this with, with all of you guys. It's been great and I think I've brought some much needed estrogen to this panel, but it's been <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> well, I did put on the wig, but yes, that doesn't really count. So My nose is getting kind of large. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. So Joe, uh, yeah, go ahead and pimp your stuff there, buddy. Oof. Okay, uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash Joe Magician on Twitter at Joe Magician 42 on the Maester Monthly podcast that I put on with my fellow A Song of Ice and Fire mods. If you didn't know, that's I do that too. Um, I'm also a feature writer for Watchers on the Wall. Coming out soon from that will be an article about how you kill a dragon, specifically Viserion, for the upcoming show, uh, using hints from the books and what's already in the show to try and figure that one out. Um, as for what's coming with YouTube, uh, as I said earlier, me and Amanda from Disputed Lands, we're doing kind of a combo Targaryen prophecy focused actually around uh, Maester Aemon and Daron the Drunkard and all the, and Duncan Egg and stuff, which coincidentally, I guess, Aziz is also working on at the same time. So you're going to get a lot of Targaryen prophecy coming up soon. It should be really good. Um, and is there anything else? No, I think that's it for me. Okay, cool. Just a uh, real quick, just a moment ago, I used an expression which I regret immediately using. Uh, I said, "Pimp out your stuff." Uh, that's not really uh, cool at all. So, just want to apologize and say that's not the greatest. And I would like to take that one back, but I said it, so sorry. And Aziz, go ahead and promote your whatever you got coming. Cool. Uh, thank you for that. Um, this was really fun. Great stream. Great chatters great questions coming from the gallery there and a lot of support and uh pumping us all up making us have even more fun than we would have had um as far as what we have coming up at history of westeros we do have blood raven part two like i said it's his middle years as hand of the king it, it'll uh it ends with um him going to the wall and then of course we'll be doing an episode of his time on the wall and becoming the three-eyed crow and all that that should be a ton of fun uh, we're also, like I said, working on an, uh, a series of episodes about Nymeria, Nymeria of the Roinar. Uh, we're not sure how many episodes that'll take. We might try to break it up one area, one episode per location she spends a lot of time in. That seems like a, a good way to, to try to approach it. We'll see how that goes. And we'll be having some more live streams on our channel periodically. Our Why We Love series is uh, new, and we've got another couple topics in the, in the uh, queue for that. So look out for all that, and um, thanks again for having me on, and I enjoyed being with uh, Joe and Gemma as well. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll uh, see you next time in our various uh, corners of the Asong Vice and Fire Internet. There it is. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, it's been a great discussion, and I am told that uh, Kyle, after one quick false start, is now up and running. So there it is, over there on the Azora Hype channel. So thanks, guys. Check out everyone's channel. And Joe, I am really excited uh, for that collaboration with Amanda. And of course, uh, that is the Disputed Lands YouTube channel where uh, you can find a lot of cool Ironborn videos, to say the least. She's told me what she has in mind, and it is impressive and awesome, and I really want to hear it. We're also going to do a live stream after we both release our videos. Nice, nice. Well, I will be there for that, for sure. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks for everyone for coming. We had 200 viewers most of the time or 190. So we got over 200. So really appreciate it. It means the world to me. Thanks for the support. And I'm going to keep cranking out these between two Weirwoods panels. Uh, we just got some new ideas for panels today. So there'll be more coming in between the mythical astronomy episodes. And like I said, next time 
I'll be seeing you with an episode about Sansa and the veil and all that really cool symbolism. We finally talk about the moon door. You better believe that something called the moon door that we throw people out of has some mythical astronomy going on. So uh, yeah, that'll be fun. That's it guys. Cheers. <laughs>